Welcome in to my excellent friends as we get ready to go through the very last episode before the break for my birthday. Uh, just a quick reminder, you'll get reminded pretty much every BRB tonight. There will be no episode next week. What's up, VT? Speaking of VT, um, go follow that dude. He plays a ton of Monster Hunter, both Rise and Stories, has a community night on Friday night. Uh, it's going back into stories next week, and then we'll be kind of going back into the variety thing, I think, after that. But VT's an awesome dude. Um, chemist. Scientist. Um, also, his girlfriend's awesome. A business analyst that uh, I joke with all the time. My lord! Thank yourself. you very much, Dagger. Speaking of that awesome business analyst girlfriend of his, Dagger also takes all my crap. Fix has a real haircut. Yeah, Fix has a real haircut. It's weird. That shouldn't be coming up, but it is coming up. Still, need to figure out why that's that's like a ghost in the machine from Darkest Dungeon. It's just gonna be there until I remember where the hell it is. I, I know I've actually turned it off graphically in the uh, in the settings. I even have a logic check says, "Hey, are you playing Darkest Dungeon? Don't play this thing then." But it still happens. In any event, um, no stream next for, uh, Saturday. It is actually my birthday. Uh, Mads will be in town. At this point in time, we'll probably be walking out of dinner and walking into an outdoor bar situation. My lord, no. Yeah, fix it all the hat. Crazy, isn't it? I got a haircut. Did a lot of things this week. I got my Jeep inspected. I got a haircut. Um, I got the bathroom all clean today. So Maz, you know, has a place that isn't all gym lockered. Uh, mopped the kitchen floors. Did a lot this week. Speaking of surfers. Oh, hello. Welcome to my stream. I was Shut abused up, by Sturf okay, last night. Help, as usual. Shut up, Rex. I can regen annoying. No, I can't do that. That's Fix's perk. See? Shut your mouth, Fix. See? See what happens? It's verbally abused by Sturf last night. In any event, we're not making a new t-shirt. Go buy an orange paint marker if you want to update your shirt. Shut your mouth, Fix. Yeah, pretty much. Um... But next week when I'm not streaming, uh, there will be something taking place in the afternoon. Uh, Yomega will be bringing in some of his friends to play Visage, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time on Yomega's channel. Make sure you're hanging out there as he continues to drive his Extra Life charity drive toward getting... He, I think his goal now is to actually outright buy one of the monitors for the uh, Beaumont Children's Hospital NICU. So if you're looking for something to do, it won't be the same time. But um, And you'll see a reminder pop in the corner down here throughout the night. But make sure you go uh, hang out with the Omega. That's this guy. Go give him. It'll be hilarious, by the way, because his friends are super jumpy. So you definitely want to get in there and scare the crap out of them. I was... N no, it was definitely not the other way around. What's up, Case? Is that how you say that game? Yes, it's not Visage. It's Visage. As in a visage, as in something you see. 
But tonight will be, um, oh, we'll get into one other thing. But tonight will be a pretty long episode. Uh, I decided early in the week to start working on the episode earlier. It is two pages longer than anything I've ever written before, typed or written by hand. And I imagine it will take us more than two and a half, closer to three hours to get through it all. Just to like you like them. But before we get into the episode tonight, I want to bring this up. We have done some work for DAV. So last year we raised 10,070 directly from this stream supporting the Omega Jake's Extra Life and we did $3,871 in total support of all kinds of charitable causes last year. And then we decided at the end of the year, uh, I talked with Mads and a few other people and I said, "Look, I want to, you know, do something that's more in line with what I feel I, I would like the charity of this stream to go to and that was Disabled American Veterans." So we started last year started handing off the bits and subs to DAV and um, prior to the start of heavyweight metal history as a thing, we had donated $558 to DAV. That's from Darkest Dungeon. That's generally from the pack buys. Um, last month, we did $460 of donations directly to DAV. So that was $460 post taxes. Uh, it was three two thirty from the stream. And then we actually had a corporate dollar match from EG America. So we actually did $460 of impact. Uh, for disabled American veterans to, from the June to July period. 20 gift subs from an anonymous user as we talk about it. All of that will go to disabled American veterans. Let's see what's happening. Prime Diadag, Brookstone Bards, Goldilocks and the Bear, Dagger gets one, Razor Wave, Savage Manatee, Saber in Space gets one, that's solid, Slice Brit, Galvos, Pac-Man, that one I can't pronounce, Fire Matthew, Inferno Shadow Ninja, Das Valdez gets one, um, that's he streams rocket launches. Spitfire 85 miles per hour. Allison Gaming Land. Was that Keem Johnson 14? Saxton Zebulganubi. Lady Marguerite. Enjoy your subs. Awesome. I know who it is. I, I have figured out who my anonymous gifter is, and I will protect their identity. So let us get going tonight, because we have a lot to talk about. You're going to notice on the board tonight, I've actually put titles over the top of names. So the entire upper row as we go through the night tonight is people who are comprised of being the Jacobins for the purposes of tonight's discussion. You're going to find out that these groups, some are going to come and go pretty quickly and people will move between them a lot. But for, as for tonight, the top row is the Jacobins. The middle row is what we'll, you'll find out to be called as the Society of 1789. Um, all of them will originally be members of the Jacobin Club. And then in the bottom left, all but the bottom right entry, is the Cordelier Club, or those people who are still agitating not from within the assembly, but from outside of the assembly in the Cordelier section of Paris during all of this. So you're going to see these titles change as we move forward. These groupings are going to change, and then people are going to move in between them. But I wanted to tell you why they're there, because they're new. The other thing I wanted to, to say or bring forward tonight was I've been sitting on this map not knowing when the right time to bring it forward is because there's a little bit of spoilery stuff with respect to the 1783 and some battles that will be fought. But this map over here, I wanted to show you specifically the red areas, these red barber pole areas. When we talked about the Great Fear, these are the major areas where like the smoke plumes were going up and people were setting the feudal records on fire and breaking down the mills and things like that. And then I also also want to call your attention to the large and the small French flags. If you'll remember several episodes back, back around the time of the Bastille, when the Paris Commune government stood up, and I talked about how Paris, you know, Commune-style governments were pretty quickly stood up all over France, the large flag indicates major cities where those Commune governments pretty much sprung to life. And the small flag indicates major cities where there had been kind of a bridged relationship built between the new commune government and the existing like city council or council of elders. It's a very interesting map. The upper right section is going to get super interesting as we get into 1783, but I'm going to get a little bit more detailed map about the battles. But you do see from that that as we approach the war state of the French Revolution that a lot of what's going to happen is going to happen up there in the Austrian Netherlands. Uh, there's some other areas that are of interest, especially the green barber pole area out here, right next to Brittany. This is called the Vendée. Um, there's actually a time period in the French Revolution that's coming called the War in the Vendée. 
And when we get to it, we'll bring this map back up so you guys can kind of see where that's happening. But I wanted to bring this map forward simply because some of the topics have been covered and I didn't want us to get too far away before I brought some of those things to light. You also notice that on tonight's map and board is the Pope because remember how last week we started talking about Talleyrand had brought forth this kind of plan to nationalize the church property, right? To take the Catholic Church's property and nationalize it as a way to pay off the debt. Remember, Necker came down to the assembly right before they got ready, or they moved to Paris. and was like, hey, buddy, we're still broke. Why haven't you guys done anything? And Talleyrand kind of stepped forward and said, hey, I got an idea. I'm a bishop. We should definitely nationalize all this Catholic Church property. The Pope isn't going to dig that too much. And this is probably one of two times that we're going to put the Pope on the board because the Pope's going to be involved tonight. But where we left things last week was, remember, a mob had marched on Versailles, right? And because he pretty much didn't have a choice, Louis had moved to Paris with his family and his courtiers and his staff to the, Tu the Tuileries Palace, this modern-day Louvre. And then a couple days later, after they kind of settled some things, the assembly followed, and we talked about the menage and how the left and right seating between radicals and conservatives is kind of how we arrive at that left and right definition today, politically, every day, in all the articles you read on everyone's angry social media feeds. Uh, when they say left and right, they're talking about how those delegates sat in the menage, which is a horse training ground that was converted into an assembly hall off of the Tuileries grounds. And remember, that move to Paris broke that center conservative coalition called the Menarchians, where you know Jean-Joseph Mounier did not make the move. He's actually above up on the emigrate, uh, emigrate board now because he eventually is forced into exile for being a counter-revolutionary. And then once they got to Paris pretty quickly, the assembly made that controversial decision that's going to, one of several, that's going to come back to bite them about the active versus passive citizenship distinction. And then how that relocation to Paris really deepened that polarization Again, back to the whole left and right thing in the menage where before they had kind of roomed and boarded it in groups by region. And when they moved to Paris, they started, they entered into the same type of accommodations. The doc, what's up? They entered into the same type of accommodations, except it was, you know, by ideology and voting histories. So that polarization grows that divide and makes things worse. So like we talked about, Talleyrand, before the move to Paris proposed that super, super radical notion of, hey, let's let's go ahead and nationalize the Catholic Church. Let's, you know, it's it's technically their ownership of French property to be, I guess, really fluid with definitions of property, but he proposed taking a third of it and saying, we should use this to kind of prop up things, to, 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 to not solidify, but to, what's the word? Can't think of the word. But to make it calmer, to make the economic situation calmer in Paris and France, to give the bankers some sort of nod that, hey, we're doing something about what's going on with all this debt we have to you. But you also remember last week I said it would be the Comte de Mirabeau who would take what Talleyrand wrote and kind of put his pen over it. Because remember, of all the things... Uh, stabilize is the word I'm looking for. Stabilize the economic situation. What's up, Rocket? But you remember I said the Comte de Mirabeau would come out and he would put his pen over it. And the Comte de Mirabeau, if anything, was a really good writer. He was a really good PR guy. And so he changes what Talleyrand says and says, you know, property won't be outright nationalized, but, quote, put at the disposal, end quote, of the nation. It'll still be, you know, run by the clergy, but with the understanding that the clergy and the bishops, they're, they're just acting as stewards of our wealth. So... At any time we really choose, what we can we can un put them in charge of that. And to the shock and horror of a lot of the conservative delegates and the clerical delegates in the National Assembly, this simple rewording makes it pass. In point of fact, it maintained the intent of the original motion, right? That we're gonna take church property and use it. It's it's property. We can you know, monetize, valueize it, and use it to shore up the economy. But it was the wording was enough to sway that middle. Remember, we talked about how there's like 200, 300 guys on the left and 200, 300 guys on the really far right, and everyone else in the middle, you know, 500 or so delegates, is really, you know, they could be swayed. And it was this, it was this really subtle change in wording that putting it at the disposal of the nation instead of 
stripping ownership of the church, even though it's the same thing, the way in which it was worded gave them the, I guess, the the conscience peace of mind and the political cover they needed to say, yeah, it's not the same thing. And that's kind of how things work today, where it's simple wording, intent is clear, but the wording can change someone's ability to get on board with something or not. And the really core cool thing here is that this demonstrated, this sweep of nationalizing the Catholic Church demonstrated that despite the recent victories for the centrist conservative Munarchians, remember they basically have only been in Paris a month, that the power of that group was waning, especially without Mounier to lead that group. And really, the National Assembly had just claimed ownership over the church's property. So in early December, and yes, we're moving that fast. Remember how we took like two and a half episodes, go to, you know, July, August, and now I just covered November like that? It's because I'm going to bounce back and forth tonight. There's topics that I, I'm going to, you know, take forward and then come back to talk about something else and go forward and then come back to talk about something else. And eventually we'll get to July 1790. But in December 1789, the assembly puts their money where their mouth is on this. And they, they approve an auction sale of 400 million livres, which is the French currency at the time, of the Catholic Church's property. And those parcels were not specified. So the Henry, uh, the assembly just pulled a Henry VIII just without the pillaging. Kinda. But the parcels they authorized for sale were not specified. They just said, we're gonna take 400 million livres of your property. We don't know what it is yet. They pass a motion that leaves that door wide open. It could literally be anything. So long it was, a, it was as it was added to the total that was authorized by the assembly. And on December 19th, the first batch of those parcels went up for sale. Proceeds from these auctions would be used to back a new kind of bond, and this is important. A bond is basically you giving money to the government in trust, and then you get something back from the government later, usually an interest. Now, bonds are used to fuel wars all the time, or war bonds in World War II. But the bond was called the Ossignon. A-S-S-I-G-N-A-T, Ossignon. And this Ossignon is going to be super important. It's actually going to turn into a form of French currency. The Alcyon would carry 5% interest. So you invest, you get 5% back. But the Alcyon notes, these bond notes, would actually be used to pay off the nation's creditors, who could then take the notes they had and redeem them back to France for pieces of national land, formerly church land. So what, what happens here is you invest in the nation, you get some Alcyon, and then you take the Alcyon and you turn that into land and property. So it was pretty crafty. They're basically saying, hey, banks, come on in, get some Ossignon, or we'll pay you with Ossignon, which you can in turn redeem for property in kind. The Catholic Church property in kind that we just swiped from them. Clergy. The clergy across France was, as you would probably assume, pretty mortified by this. They took to their pulpits and effectively promised that anyone who got in on this scheme would suffer internal damnation in the fires of hell. Pretty much. If you come around and get on board with this scheme where, you know, you acquire enseignants from the government and then use those enseignants to buy what used to be the church's property, you're going to burn in hell. This is all before the turn of the uh, end of the year. We're still in 1789. But having lost the vote on citizenship and winning this vote on the church's property, the radical section of the assembly sensed their opportunity to kind of snatch the momentum back from the conservative centrists and the ultra-arch conservatives. And they spent this winter, this winter of 1780, 17, sorry, 1789, 1790, getting ready to do just that. You'll remember that way back when the Estates General started, the really ready for a fight delegation came from Brittany, which is up in that little piece sticking out near the Atlantic Ocean up there. And they were joined in with by the Paris radicals who also were itching for a fight when the Estates started. Well, this group became that Breton Club, remember? And this is, this is the curtain coming down on the Breton Club. Because the Breton Club would be reorganized. The old members of that club gathered together in Paris over the winter and decided to form a new club. A new club that will come 
to dominate the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror. It would be far more organized, disciplined, and centralized than the loose form that the Breton Club had. And, and you remember, it is that loose form, this freewheeling debate society that kind of put them underneath the boot heel of the Munarchians as the Munarchians organized that first real whip voting block in the assembly when it was still in Versailles. And this new structure that this new club would take on would allow them to combat that voting structure that was already in place in the center right of the Menage. And so in late November, early December 1789, this group leased some space from the Dominican convent of Saint-Jacques. And the group originally called themselves the Society of Friends of the Constitution. That sounds super nice, doesn't it? It sounds like the Society of Friends of the Constitution will come along and support this, you know, constitution that we're still trying to finish writing. But immediately they started to be called the Jacobins because of the convent of Saint-Jacques. Saint-Jacques, Jacobin, do you get it? Lil Sus. And it took them less than a month to adopt the nickname that pretty much everyone else had given them. And the Society of the Friends of the Constitution falls off their letterhead, effectively, and the Jacobins becomes their name. The Jacobins are a word or a group name that should at least hopefully ring a bell somewhere in most people's heads. They are... Remember to clonk that follow button. Don't forget to clonk that follow button. But they are historically important. The Jacobins will again, come to dominate the French Revolution. They will fracture multiple times as people will say, okay, that's enough. But they will be the engine for the reign of terror when we get there. Like I said, the Jacobins will undergo these distinct periods of radicalization. They'll kind of take it to 10 and say, hey, how's everybody feel about that? And then to find a new 10 and just go higher and higher and higher until they're really really off the rails and some of that will be you know driven by Jean-Paul Marat sitting in the Cordelier the Cordelier yeah the Cordelier just um fueling sentiment because we talked about how how safe are you in Paris if you're not respecting what the mob wants and the Jacobins are going to realize that they're going to understand that I'm going to get to your question but the Jacobins are going to realize that their interest being in parallel to the more radical elements, the more violently leaned elements of Paris is probably in their interest. And if you go back and remember in July, the Bretons had the same mindset. They were willing to leverage violence for political end. The, the Jacobins are going to stick with that. Is the reign of terror the same as acid rain? No. No. Now one's a weather phenomenon and the other is a major historical event. <sighs> So the Jacobins, like I said, they're going to undergo several engine revs of craziness as we go through things. But initially, it wasn't that crazy. In order to join the Jacobins, as they formed coming into 1790, you really only had to support three basic principles. It's okay, Dagger. Everyone's bad at history. I'm bad at history. I just know this because I have read this a lot recently. But you had to support three basic things. You had to support, you must be dedicated to upholding constitutional government. Which is a principle I don't think the Jacobins stick to very well over the long term. You must support political equality for all. That's that's pretty noble. I can get behind that idea. And the, the real driving motivation behind that was that meant you could not support the active-passive citizenship distinction. That this meant everybody who was male had to be you know, granted suffrage. It's, I, I do love the fact that it actually says for all in their original charter, but they still only mean men. And you, this is the important one. Number three, you must be ready to combat counter-revolutionary plots. What's a counter-revolutionary plot? Who determines what is a counter-revolutionary idea? Because remember, there's already people within just the assembly 
Now, take the Arch Conservatives, put them on a shelf, right? Because there's backwater marquees and, and comps that are out there going, I want things the way they were back when we had the three estates and feudalism was a thing. And when no one was ever going to go back there at this point, right? Not at this point. So the notion of returning to the, state, the status quo antebellum was just not something that was going to happen. You know, there was a line that had been crossed, kind of a point of no return with the Bastille and the Declaration of the Rights of Man. There, there's, but is this the plateau? No way. This way. Is this the plateau? Is this where the revolution stops? And anybody who works to undermine this state from either the left or the right, are they counter-revolutionary? Because that's what Mounier believed, right? He left because he felt that when the mob forced the assembly and the king to do a bunch of stuff through violence back in October, that that was way past the line, that this government cannot be that subservient to mob violence. So he, because he couldn't even support what was going on right now, you know, claiming the property of the Catholic Church, that's why he was very quickly labeled by the people back in Delphine a counter-revolutionary, because he was opposed to the momentum of moving forward. And the Jacobins believed that they weren't done yet. Not by a long shot was the revolution done. But you had liberal nobles kind of in the middle. Remember the Society of 30? Those principles, the principles of 1789. Kind of, maybe this was it. This was enough. You know, we had empowered the third estate, the educated members of the third estate and the bourgeoisie, but we'd empowered them as they had intended to do. And maybe, maybe this is where the stop sign was. But that definition of what is counter-revolutionary is going to become really important. Because the Jacobins, just like the concepts of the general will, are going to abuse that concept. Because, remember, majority will and general will are two different things. And what is counter-revolutionary is a really subjective concept, just like what the general will is. So you have, again, all these nebulous ideas entering into the way in which these organizations function. And how they will act upon those ideas is really up to personal interpretation of whomever has the levers of power at the time. And that individual is going to be Maximilian Robespierre. We're going to get to Maximilian Robespierre. He's the upper right-hand corner of the board right now. And today's the day we're going to introduce him. Um, he's been here the whole time. But he, he, he kind of he will step far enough out from behind the curtain for me to go through a little bit of a biography of him. So when people came to this new Jacobin club, as we will now call it from now on, I'm not going to call it the Friends of the Constitution for a month, when people came to the Jacobins, they found a national assembly in miniature. The Jacobins met initially three times a week, and they would review assembly business. They would review past events that had happened in the assembly, and they would draw out future plans. It sounds a lot like the Monarchians, right? Sat down, figured out how things had gone, where they wanted things to go, and they would build a voting block around it. And that's what the Jacobins did. They built this organizational structure all through December and January, December 1789 and into January 1790. Their rules for speaking and debate within the Jacobin Club pretty much mirrored the assembly. And here's the really important thing. We can go all the way back to when Brienne in 1788 brought those, here's the plan to save the economy, into the Parlement, right? And I told you at that point the really critical element was that the audience was present, right? That it changed from political science to political theater and the assembly's been open to the audience the whole time and the jacobins are open to the public you don't have to be a member to come hang out and watch and so here you are not in versailles anymore but in the paris you know the middle of paris and the mobs are coming in cat calling the things they don't like and cheering the things they do like and it's television to them this is entertainment this is live impromptu theater to the to the audience and the audience is going to be this consistent thing where as all of these groups evolve and the assembly evolves and the constitutions evolve the audience is ever present and everyone who knows anything knows they have to play to that audience so to keep their matters on track the jacobins would adopt one other thing the monarchians had and that was a central steering committee you remember that what's up arky you remember that Mounier had the Central Steering Committee and he brought in De Premenil to kind of solidify his right flank to get those conservatives on board when they realized they didn't have the voting juice and the centrist conservatives, you know, that center right was the lesser of two evils compared to the Breton Club. They had that steering committee. Well, the Jacobins do one too. And this 
would guide policy decisions. Like for the larger body of all Jacobins, it would guide and decide how they wanted to move forward on pretty much everything. And it mirrored the way the Munarchians did things really well, which was smart because what the Munarchians had done had worked. You know, we walk out of the committee and everyone gets their marching orders and they go vote and we control the offices as they rotate through the assembly. All of that happens, except the Munarchians are on the way out, remember? Remember we talked about how with the lack of Munia being present, the Munarchians were basically going to fade and there's a power vacuum? Well, the Jacobins are going to compete within that power vacuum. But the Jacobins went and did one thing that was beyond what the Munarchians had did. And this is critical. They established something called the Committees of Correspondence. I can't, I can't tell if it's pluralized or not, so I'm just going to say the Committee of Correspondence. And what this did, this Committee of Correspondence within the Jacobin Club, is opened up lines of communication to those of a, of a like mind all out in the provinces on all the other cities where the Munarchians were kind of you know, a closed group centralized around the assembly the jacobins said no what we're going to do is spider web out across all of france and find everyone who thinks the same things we do and we're going to have them establish jacobin chapters everywhere so that this is not just about controlling the assembly because see all those big and small French flags on that left-hand side map where those commune governments had stood up and they had adopted similar style assembly governments. The Jacobins will use the Committee of Correspondence to reach out into those governments, find the like-minded, and not only control the voting block within the National Assembly, but within the Provincial Assemblies and the Taxation Assemblies everywhere. And they will be far more organized than anybody else out there. They pursued political action and organization outside of the capital, and they established these chapters of the Jacobins all over France. They don't know. The Illuminati are a secret society. These guys are not a secret society. These guys are front and center. Here we are. Come attend our meetings. Find out what we're talking about. They're very public. The Illuminati are a secret society. They're no, nothing, there's a, mm -mm, nothing like it. That's kind of, I don't know about if you chop one of their heads off two more stand up over time, but maybe it's the, the spider web or tentacles idea, though, yes. This gave the Jacobins, as an organization, legitimate claim that they were more representative of France as a whole than the National Assembly was, right? Because remember, when the National Assembly was organizing before the, it became... Yo, Mega Jake, thank you for the resub. 13 months of tier three. That guy right there, his link just popped in the chat. Or will pop in the chat as soon as the bot wants to do it. Oh, he'll actually have to talk. Ty type something else, Yomega, so your shout out plays. But make sure you go follow Yomega, 12 p.m. Eastern time, a week from tonight or today. He'll be doing charity with his friends in Visage. Go make sure you hang out, support and spread the word. Drop a couple bucks if you can. That guy in that link, go hit that. When that link decides to play. But coming back to this concept where the Jacobins had had spread out into France, right? They had their tentacles or their feelers or their, their message, their lines of communication had dug in all across France over the winter into the spring. But back when the estates were forming and you had those, those assemblies of electors and they took the Cahiers, which was all those lists of things that everyone was pissed about, and they threw out all the rural complaints. Remember, the bourgeoisie said, nah, we don't want that one, we don't want that one. And I told you it'd be a problem. It would be a repetitive problem. This is one such instance because the Jacobins will listen to those things. They will take into account what the people of Rheims or Bordeaux or the surrounding areas who are audience members of those provincial Jacobin clubs have to say because the lines of communication for the Committee of Correspondence is bidirectional. The main executive steering committee in Paris is listening to what the provinces have to say as they move forward. And it was almost like they had better political intelligence than anybody else. But critically, and this is my interpretation, this is one of the first true examples of an organized national political party coming into fruition. We, we kind of talked about the voting block of the Munarchians being that first step 
the organized whip, the way to get everybody in, you know, on the same page who had a like mind so that we could control the, the, the seats within the assembly and we could be, ensure our majorities. The Jacobins go a step further and they get this real true political machine. This, you know, we'll we'll sit in the seat of power and reach out to not only the city governments and the and the county governments, but the grassroots audience members are more than welcome to let us know how they feel about things by booing or cheering pretty much. And this was not the Jacobins were not the parties of America at this time. And for those of you who are kind of familiar with the way in which the constitutional debate went down in America, it generally rotated around two people, Hamilton or Jefferson. And the political parties became parties of philosophy of those individuals where, you know, it, you either believe what Jefferson thought or you believe what Hamilton thought. And the political for party formed around one individual on both sides of that partisan divide in the Americas. And that's not what the Jacobins were doing. There was not one at this point. There was not one person in control of the radical momentum and decision making of the Jacobins. They were, they were much, much broader than that, which is why I don't think the early Whigs or anything like that are really political parties. I think the Jacobins are. The Jacobins organized around the idea of this wide sweeping reach. And the Committee of Correspondence is critical in their power grab because at their height, there were 7,000 Jacobin clubs across France that boasted over a half million active members. No other organized club of any kind, political or otherwise, or any other entity in France, maybe except for the army, over this revolutionary period in France could ever come close. And no one else comes close to this level of political participation. Most of the major revolutionary figures at some point or another will count themselves as members of the Jacobins. And on the board right now, obviously the entire top row, Dupour, Barnav, Lamette, those are the guys we called the triumvirs that really controlled the conversation coming out of Versailles and into Paris. Maximilien Robespierre will come to dominate and control the Jacobins pretty significantly as we roll into 1782 and 1783. But Lafayette was initially a member of the Jacobins, and so was Talleyrand, and so was Mirabeau, and so was this other guy on the right I've never talked about, Pierre, you know, Jacques-Pierre Brissot. They will be members of the group initially, and then very quickly some of them will go, hmm, this isn't for me. But first I want to talk about Robespierre. Maximilian Robespierre, this guy right here. One, he looks a little weird. Things that make you go, hmm, indeed. Maximilian Robespierre is one of the most significant historical people in the French Revolution. I would probably say that in terms of impact, no other person has a greater impact on the total momentum and direction of the French Revolution than Napoleon. Um, Talleyrand is also up there, but Talleyrand was a shadow broker. He was a guy that never was at the forefront of anything and never was leading the charge in any one direction. Like I said, he read where the wind blowed very well, where Rose Pierre was a different kind of guy entirely. Talleyrand was a pragmatist pseudo con man to a degree where he knew how to play the people, the right tune at the right time. Robespierre can almost be called the opposite of that, where he is a staunch, entrenched man of principle. Now, they're his principles and his virtues, not what we might consider to be principled or virtuous behavior. But he was born in 1758 in North France, near the border with the Austrian Netherlands, which is modern-day Belgium. Um, both his grandfather... And his father had been lawyers in Paris, but Robespierre was largely raised by his grandparents. Uh, when his mother died at an early age and his father kind of said, his father did not deal with it. And Robespierre's father kind of went on this world tour of something and just left the scene and left Robespierre to be raised by his grandparents. But he was living in a, a town or a larger town called, uh, called Arras. And that's actually where he was born as well. And the Bishop of Arras 
kind of he came to the attention of the bishop of Paris, and not in the weird Catholic Church way. Generally, as a you know a promising intellectual young man, you know, and the bishop of Paris got him a scholarship to the Lycée Louis le Grand, which the Lycée is still a prestigious secondary school in, in France. But he gets him a scholarship to the Lycée Louis le Grand, where he was actually a classmate of Camille de Moulin. So you have Maximilien Robespierre sitting up here, and then you have Camille de Moulin who is sitting down at the bottom in the Coil U right now. And remember, De Moulin is that guy who stood up on the table at the Palais Royal and pointed out there and said the soldiers are coming and stirred that massive upswell of resistance right before the Bastille. They were classmates at the same time at the Lycée Louis Le Grand. But they didn't travel in the same social circles at all. And Robespierre, while he was in school, had this reputation of being super serious. And that kind of fits everything we know about him. He was a super serious student. Let me slide this over a little bit so we can get those other individuals back on the screen. But Robespierre was, it was weird, to say the least. He was not a typical French bourgeoisie guy. He believed in the Enlightenment, things like that, but he was just off in terms of how the flow of things went. He just was kind of one step out of it. Um, he graduated from the Lycee in 1781, so you're talking... He graduated nine years before what we're talking about right now, and he returned to Eris to become a lawyer. He made a name for himself representing poor plaintiffs due to the principles at stake, not the amount of money he would make. And that right there kind of sets him out of line with the lawyers of the time because he was more interested in representing someone's claim, whether it was valid or not, and not how much could I garner from the person being sued and things like that. Yeah, pro bono man. A pro bono man of principle. And I think at that point in time, probably good principle. Robespierre is going to warp over time. He was admitted to the local academy, which there's a ton of these little academies all over the place. They're just basically clubs, institutions for the Enlightenment thinkers. And he was basically on his way to becoming you know, a pillar of the, the heiress community, this good guy in the heiress community that, you know, was looking out for the little guy and, and he made a name for himself. He took up cases to make sure he could pay his bills and live a life that he wanted to live, but he, he didn't step on the little guy. When the little guy walked to his door and said, please help me, he was the guy. He was going to be that guy for them. He was, he was really in this place in the 1780s and 1880s where he was literally going to be this good pillar of society where he was from. But when the revolution started... And the ball starts rolling in the middle 1780s and into the Estates General, like we've covered. He wanted in on it. He wrote essays about the new electors' procedures. Like, whenever, remember, Necair came out and said, Hey, how do you want to do this? Because we're six months away and we don't know what to do. He was writing essays. He was supporting the notions of doubling the third and vote by head. And that's also in line with this stand up for the little guy mentality. He stood for election of stood for election as a delegate from the area around Eris, and he and this is really one of those moments in history where you go what if he squeaks into the assembly like he barely got his seat and given how much he will do and control over time imagine like 30 votes went the other way and he doesn't get in there's another opportunity for him to come to power, but that would mean, at least in the what-if scenario, he would not be one of the founding members of the Jacobins. So his ability to get and control the Jacobins would have been diminished. It is one of those moments where you're just like, man, what if that hadn't happened? What if, what if, what if Maximilian Robespierre had not been in the National Assembly? It was real close to being true. Once he arrived in Versailles, for the estates and then into the assembly yeah fate steps in and kicks france in the butt should just be the name of history from 1750 until 1812 in france <laughs> until the the treaty of vienna puts napoleon in a box finally that's pretty much what it should be but once he found himself in Versailles at the assembly, he found himself to be a leader within the radicals. Like, he, he carried around this mix of Rousseau, and Montesquieu, and Voltaire, but he also had this extreme, and you'd have to know Roman history, but this really hard notion of what Roman virtue was. And before the fall of the Roman Republic, virtue was a big deal. 
like the the term dictator as we know it today comes from rome because rome was ruled by two consuls two heads of state that worked together because rome was super scared of a despot king and in times of extreme need they would appoint from the senate and the consuls a dictator and this dictator was appointed for a period of time to solve a specific problem usually a military problem and the dictator would relinquish those powers when he was done which is unheard of in modern society who gives up power right but it's an example of roman virtue in that time you know 500 bce when the people of rome before the opulence of greek you know influence kind of corrupted them and they didn't have anybody really to contend with the dictator was actually a really good guy and it this was is your job we pay you and celebrated when a dictator would relinquish those powers back to the senate and the people of rome and the consuls so it's that idea that robespierre's got in his head right the idea of what it means to be virtuous and this notion of virtue will I'll argue drive him nuts over time. It won't drive him to be like looting the streets nuts, but it'll drive his policy decision making to the idea of what defines where virtue springs from and what is defined as a virtuous act combined with this in this just blender pool of enlightenment thinking and it comes from Rousseau and Montesquieu and Voltaire. Remember, Rousseau and Montesquieu were polar opposites, right? One was an enlightenment thinker, one head of the Romanticist movement. But he's got all this in his head, and he's not stupid. He's well-educated. And because of this, he called for the end of any institution that would threaten or corrupt this idea of fundamental virtue. What is that? You'd have to ask him, because what's virtuous is a very subjective notion. I mean, we could, we could land on the idea of basic moral actions are virtuous, right? But beyond that... Robespierre will define things that are well past that line that are what is and what is not a virtuous act. And people will die because of what he thinks they did or did not do was virtuous or harmful to the virtue of others. What's up, Mads? He was opposed to the whole active-passive distinction. He believed that the more representative a government was, the better it must be. And that's a pretty, I mean, representative government is good in a general sense, but I will also argue that an educated electorate is super important to that. And again, to make a modern parallel, we do not have an educated electorate. We have an electorate that is an echo chamber, that they, they live and breathe in false statement of fact, and they do not fact check. They do not independently investigate. I mean, there are, you know, obviously, and I hope the people that come here and are interested in learning are doing those things, but... I miss you, Arky. Remember to clonk that follow button. But the idea of a more representative government is by default better. I think it's really important to have a curious electorate for that to be true. And one of the safeguards in the American elect elective system, especially in the in the government, it was intended to you know kind of counter this, where we have a representative democracy where we elect based on people within a state, a certain number of representatives to the lower house, and then every state gets equal representation in the upper house. That balance is really important to the way the original US government was formed. And the bicameral legislative nature of that makes, there's a check and balance in that system that does not exist in a unicameral, everyone can vote based on whatever system. He was right in, uh, Robespierre was right in this or reorganization of the left. Like right as they came back to, to Paris or came to Paris and Mounier heads for the hills of Dauphine, he was in the middle of it. He was already a leader of the left radicals. And he reorganizes the left into the Jacobins along with Dupour, Barnav, and Levement. And remember, Barnav was the guy who wrote down the rules, right? He was the guy who came up with the, the rules and structure and bylaws of the Jacobins. But Robespierre was one of those early spearheading leaders. He was on the executive committee. He was heavily engaged in the committee of correspondence he was he was this really driven guy because going back to his days at the last louis the grown he had that reputation of just being a serious student he was a serious legislator as well he helped found the club he sat on the steering committee he sat on it 
with the Triumvirs, and Mirabeau was on the steering committee to start as well. And many of the other founders, like I said, like Lafayette and Talleyrand and Mirabeau, they're going to quickly distance themselves from the, the Jacobins when they see where the Jacobins are going. But Robespierre would use the Jacobins as his own personal engine for power and to do pretty much whatever he wants as we move into the further years of the early 1780s. So that'll give you a basic sense of who the guy is. He is extremely important. He is the most important Jacobin. There's going to come to be a thing called the Committee of Public Safety. Yeah, that's an ominous name for something. And he'll be on it and eventually own it and eventually use it to drive people like Louis Saint-Just, who gains the name the Angel of Death. You'll remember from the very first episode's opening credits. Because it's from that committee within not the Jacobins, but the assembly, as it is defined at that time, that will drive the reign of terror. But everything that flows into the assembly's major committees is going to come from the Jacobins. So we're going to take a break. And when we come back, it's not just the left who organizes. The right reorganizes as well. In the absence of the centrist conservatives leaves what the arch conservatives think is also a wide open kind of middle to grab and say, hey, things have gone too far. Come over to our side. And the right will reorganize as well. And we'll talk about that. And then the foreshadowed many times break within the Jacobins as quickly as they formed. And then down the line in an hour or two, we'll talk about the actual death of the estates. But get up, get a drink. I hope you're enjoying yourself. Don't forget, next Saturday there is no episode, 12 p.m. Eastern Time. There will be a charity stream on your Omega Jay's channel that will, um, that will be driving for extra life, scaring his friends. I actually need to turn that timer on because it hasn't played. And I've noticed it hasn't played because there we go. So let me enable that now and run that for you guys well, once. No. Yes, yes, one second. I want to run that real quick. That right there. What's up, Terry? Let's reach out and touch. That right there. Make sure you're hanging out for that next week. Glad you're enjoying yourself, Terry. I'm glad you're all enjoying yourself. And one of the other things I wanted to comment on before the break is um, one of the goals here was obviously to take you guys through an understanding of how we arrived in the modern world, right? And we're, you can obviously see we're doing that, but it's going to get much more much more clear as we go into you know the 20th century but another goal was to get people curious and i've been very happy to see people becoming curious there's been a lot of people saying oh i'm, I'm learning about the mongols or i'm learning about this section of history i'm learning about that or hey fix where's those podcasts you always talk about dan carlin's hardcore history is a model for this you know way i, I do this podcast kind of freewheeling through topics but so is the way in which uh mike duncan has done his podcast and sort of a point by point jump around a little bit by you know biographical timeline um, so if you're looking for a good podcast, I've already turned Diggity on to History of Rome podcast, which I think he enjoyed. I know Dustin is going through uh, the Mongol history for Dan Carlin, but this that curiosity that I was trying to draw out of people to say, hey, maybe whenever, as Sturfer says, I should have, you know, I was too young for history to be important to me in high school, but now I understand how it actually is important to understand these lessons. So I, I'm very, very encouraged from seeing everyone really get curious. And it's, it's enheartening to me to go, I'm having that level of impact. So thank you all for doing that. But we'll be right back. We'll talk about how the right reorganizes and get into the rest of it. Enjoy the BRB music from CS Live, CF Live. And uh, we'll talk to you in just a few.
No way! Welcome back. We're back if you're still in the kitchen or wherever. Read, oh, yeah, there we go. Mads has the Brigand Company out from DD. You probably should change that into the Paris Mob or something that's historically contextual. Um, and we obviously can buy your Stream Loots pack cards with, uh, with your tributes. So make sure that uh, you're doing that because uh, there are cards that work here. And uh, to reiterate a point I made last week, I don't care about interruptions. I had people apologizing to me after the stream saying, I'm sorry I interrupted you. And I'm like, it doesn't bug me. Um, I want to know when the regulars are here because that makes me aware here of how many people may be watching, uh, which helps me because that, you know everyone will tell you, every streamer will tell you that the interactivity in chat is what gets their you know their juice going it's what drives them and when chat kind of dies it's really hard sometimes to go you know is anyone paying attention put them in the iron maiden iron maiden excellent so i don't care about those interruptions argo never ever ever apologize for being late ever you're you arrive precisely when you yes, mean I'm to excited about the guillotine. i am too we're getting there Rose Pierre is going to be one of those guys. Uh, I can tell you that the guillotine is going to come to the fore probably in the fall of 1790. But don't apologize for being late. Um, that's why we have the VOD. Everyone's got their schedule. This is the schedule that works for me to do it live. And we're basically doing a live take podcast once every you know Saturday. <laughs> but anyway, I'll digress on the point just that I don't care about the interruptions. Um, it's just a stream still, right? This is It's an educational stream, and I'm talking at length. But I want... The chat interaction. I want to see you show up. I want to see you say hi. And I want to see your questions. I will stop what I'm talking about. I've got a notebook right in front of me. I know where I was. I can get right back to where I was. Um, on that point, I mentioned before the stream started that this is a 15-page outline tonight for an extended episode. To give you an idea of how long it took to get through three and a half pages. Because that's as much as we covered in the first 50 minutes. No one wanted to go raid with you, Mads. Yeah, me too. I hope I hope we can sort it out. Uh, number 98, I really want to see you over my birthday weekend. I imagine we're going to be on Southside Saturday night uh, next week, so uh, we'll, we'll need to sort that for sure. Um, we have other plans for Sunday that involve going out toward, like, the Laurel Highlands and seeing some historical spots, but definitely going to be down t uh, down on the Southside on, on Saturday night. You need a podcast by Thursday. <laughs> I can recommend something else to you to listen to on the drive. But for those who don't know, Mads is coming here for my birthday next weekend. We're going to hang out. We're going to you know, go see some places and see where I grew up and see some historical places. Like We're going to see where the first shots of the uh, Seven Years' War were fired in the Americas, which is not that far from me. It's about an hour and a half drive. 
And uh, we're also going you know, to go see some, um, some you know, pretty impressive architecture and some other things. But anyway, back to our topics for tonight. Let's talk about the organization, the birth of the Jacobins, and this massive entity that's going to hang around quite a while. But the right will also need to reorganize. And in the wake of the departure of Mounier, the right would see a chance. Everyone kind of sees a chance. They see the, the, the leader of the Monarchians gone and this vacancy of power. So a similar process to the Jacobins was also underway on the right-hand side, but it was nowhere near on the scale, and it didn't get to the levels of success that the Jacobins would get to. And a result of this reorganization on the right-hand side of the assembly would mean that it would become even more conservative than it had been before. And you remember, when, when Mounier had organized the Monarchians, the centrist conservatives, the middle right, were the drivers. And the art conservatives were along the, for, for the ride because they didn't have their own strength as kind of being in a lesser of two evils proposition. And they were the junior partners within the Monarchians. Remember, um, Jean-Jacques de Premignol got in on the executive committee as kind of a, the, the compromise, the handshake that brought in those art conservatives to support the Monarchians generally. But as a result of this reorg, the roles got reversed, and the Monarchians were now the junior partner supporting the more conservative delegates. Because remember, Mounier left because he felt that things had gone too far, and that sentiment was largely agreed to by the rest of who had been the Monarchians. And so now they were like, yeah, well, this is, this is over the line, and in order to kind of pull things back, we have to go over with the arch conservatives and the arch conservatives were in the driver's seat. Some of Mounier's friends did try to create kind of a successor to the Monarchians called the impartials, but the impartials seriously had trouble recruiting due to their centrist views. And even those who got recruited, which is only about 70 delegates, only 20 were really super, really passionate about the idea of the, the impartials and it went nowhere. The position that the impartials had that the revolutionary was effectively over and had to be consolidated by a strong king and a strong Catholic church garnered no friends on the left, right? Because the front, the left wanted to box in the king and pretty much tell the church what to do. And it didn't get any support from the right because the extreme right was still wanting to undo everything and return things to the way they were. And even enlightened nobles like you know, Lafayette and Talleyrand couldn't support the impartials because the impartials had this real hyper support of the Catholic Church. And, you know, the idea of the Enlightenment was kind of the idea that the atheist bishops had at the time, which was, and again, not challenging anyone's religious views, but these men believed the idea of the religion to be kind of nonsense. They looked at it and was like, you know, no, that's not true. And they, they saw religion as a, you know, especially the idea of religious dogma as a system of control of the uneducated, which, you know, in the theory of political science, it is. You know, it's very much designed, the dogmatic nature of religion is designed to do that. You know, you believe what you want to believe. I'm not criticizing anyone's beliefs. Just saying that that's the way these guys saw it. And I always qualify that. I know I do, but I'm seeking to present fact and not damage anyone's sensibilities. This vacuum that was created in the center right when the Monarchians kind of just died out gets initially filled by this reorganized right. This group that reorganizes on the right hand side is called the Augustinians, and as opposed to the Jacobins, who are public, right? They were out there, said, Come to our meetings and, you know, be in the crowd, be basically the cheering section for the event. The Augustinians were super secretive. They were shadowy. And not much is known about them even today because they didn't keep meetings of their uh, minutes of their meetings and they didn't keep duplicate records of any of their correspondence. So if you want to bring in the Illuminati thing, this is the place to bring that in because they were much closer to the definition of a secret society. And initially they held their meetings in the convent of the Grands Augustin, which is or Augustine, which is where they get their name from, the Augustinians. The convent of the Grand Augustine is where they met initially. Yeah, Augustinian. 
but they eventually were forced out of the convent of the Grand Augustan because people who lived around the Grand Augustan didn't want them there. They didn't want what they saw as these guys who they knew right next door, you know, in the basement of that convent were planning to undo the revolution. They didn't want them there. And so the Augustans retained the name, but they went from least space here to least space here to least space there. And it got so bad that they eventually just had to start rotating their meetings kind of randomly into members' homes in order to meet because the Paris radicals were all over them. At the core of the Augustinians were about 200 members, and they were all delegates. They were all delegates to the assembly. The old disaffected nobles, like a coffee clutch, kind of. But the old disaffected nobles who never sought the end of the three estates or the Ancien Regime in the first place were there, and many of the clergy. You remember, back when the National Assembly was formed, right? We're talking, you know, May, June, July of 1789. There was a deal struck between the third estate delegates and the first estate clerical delegates, the non-bishop delegates that, hey, come on over, let's kind of band together, and whatever we do, we're never going to get rid of the tithe, and now the tithe was gone, and so was the idea that, hey, the assembly is stealing church property from you guys. The clerics at this point were like, okay. Most of the clerics, a lot of them, the majority of them were like, okay, this has gone way too far. And so they gravitated toward the Augustinians because at least the Augustinians wanted to kind of get some sense of sanity back to the way things used to be. The Augustinians published no manifestos, no newspapers. And this is an era of hyper, hyper publication in Paris, where everyone and their brother was getting a printing press, and, you know, there's Marat pumping out two, three, four editions a week. There are, there are all of these publishers and writers out there doing papers all the time, and the Augustinians produce nothing. No statement of what they believe in. No, you know, weekly paper to rally the people around. So again, it adds to that aura that they're the secret society. And the secrecy that they created around themselves did not help them as it bred paranoia that this group of 200 or so was actively brewing counter-revolutionary plots. And that's kind of true, right? Because everyone knew what they wanted. They wanted to take things back. They wanted to bring feudalism back. They wanted to bring back, you know, noble privilege that existed before the night of August of 4, 1789. They wanted to go way back to where the Parlement was still the check on the king and when you have that element in your midst, it does breed paranoia about counter-revolutionary plots happening. Now, the distinction is, what were they actually plotting versus what they did plot? And the idea that there's a counter-revolutionary plot, which go back to the Jacobins' three points of, you must be ready to stand against counter-revolutionary plots. Well, here's the Augustinians on the right, kind of doing that without saying they're doing it, without there being any great evidence of them doing it because they were so secretive, but it's there. It's there. It's this bubbling smoke over the horizon that kind of, you know, just what are they up to in there? They've got to be doing something. They're just up there, up to something. There were no records or statements, and so the crazier theories of what they were up to in this era of really accepting of crazy ideas kind of caught hold. The group certainly sought to undermine and undo the revolution, but the how they went about it was not necessarily in line with what the public thought they were up to. But one such plot that was uncovered involved the guy on the bottom right-hand screen, Thomas or Thomas de Mehi, the Marquis de Favre. He was accused of helping this other guy over here, this dude right here. Louis Stanislav Xavier, the Comte de Provence, the king's brother. The Marquis de Favre was accused of conspiring with the Comte de Provence, who was still in France. He hadn't emigrated like his other brother. And the, their plot basically said that the Comte de Provence planned to rescue the royal family and whisk them out of the country. And the concept of this plot is really important because it's going to play out later this, this fall in 1790. But the idea that the Comte de Provence wanted to step in well, then. Don't forget, 
next Saturday. Let's reach out and touch them. But the Comte de Provence wanted to step in, seeing as how you know, basically Louis and the royal family were now on house arrest in the Tuileries Palace, that he wanted to step in and get them out. The plot also was supposedly going to take out Lafayette by in the care. They were slated to be assassinated as a part of this plot. And then Paris would be surrounded by troops loyal to the Comte de Provence to basically hold the line, to make it happen. So the Marquis de Favre was accused of being the point man for everything that was supposedly going to go down in Paris for the Comte de Provence on December 24, 1789. And the Comte de Provence, who again had not emigrated, came to the Paris Commune and said, I don't know nothing about what this is. You know, I, I, who's that? I, we don't mean, you know, within the standard plausible deniability aspect of things, the Comte de Provence, and again, who knows if this is true or not? Who knows if there was actively a plot? But if there was, if there was a plot, the Comte de Provence at this point hangs the Marquis de Favre out the dry and says, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. So Favre was put on trial for about two months where there was a serious lack of evidence and refusal of witnesses to testify that led to significant doubt about his guilt but in january there was an attempt to spring him from jail to spring the comte de provence or i'm sorry the marquis de favre from jail and it was foiled and then all doubt about his guilt evaporated because why would you need to be broke out of jail if you're not guilty right let the justice system do its job and we'll get you out and the idea of the justice system in france is about to go off the rails too but if you didn't, if you were innocent, the court would prove you so. So why did you need to be busted out of jail? And so he was pretty much convicted in the public eye at that point. On February 18th, Favre was sentenced to hang. And he was sent to the gallows the next day. And what's significant about his execution, there's a reason I highlight this plot, is there was no special privilege given to him about the mode or the place of execution right he's a noble in the sense of you know the idea that it's, it does still exist it will for a little bit longer he's a noble and nobles who were to be executed were usually given the right to choose how they would be killed and it was done in private but he was put on public display and hung so dustin had asked earlier today if someone's gonna die tonight the answer is yes so here we go let's get this gentleman up here along with his name and let's get him on the death side, because he gets hung. Was he guilty? Was he innocent? I don't know. But I do know he died for it. And I also know that if he and the Comte de Provence were plotting to do what is they were accused of, the Comte de Provence keeps his head, because one day the Comte de Provence is going to be king. A little bit. But, Tomato Mayhi dies nickname patsy yeah maybe again who knows who he was a noble in a town that didn't like him remember we talked about last week the whole idea of nobles constantly looking over their shoulders because they didn't know where that group of disgruntled sound culot was going to go with their knives this is probably an instance of that to a degree where there was an opportunity to get a noble um but it does come back around to the idea of there wasn't a whole lot of evidence against him, and the court of public opinion kind of convicted him based on the idea that someone tried to bust him out of jail. Was he involved in the Remember plot to, to get him out of jail? Remember to that follow button. Didn't even know it was coming? Again, we don't know. He did die. And the this is a cautionary tale about the idea of mob or radical justice because mob and radical justice can start to look away from fact and evidence of guilt uh, we're, we're really you know we're really kind of close to that today where we want to go after people of the last administration because they were a part of the last administration it's dangerous if you don't set a precedent that law and order should rule the day that everyone gets treated fairly under the law and that the political pendulum of justice swings with whomever's in power, then justice is meaningless. And that's the dangerous thing that's kind of set into, it's an example of, with uh, with the Favre, the, ex, the, ex, the hanging of Favre, where he really didn't have, there wasn't a case against it. Yet there he is, swinging in the gallows in February.
Yeah, too bad that no one thought that maybe an attempt to break him out was also to frame him. Again, possible, and a very good point. It's very possible that radicals tried to break him out to frame him in the absence of guilt because they didn't have the evidence. That sure happened during the British Civil War, the English Civil War, sorry, it was England at the time. England Civil War fabricated all manner of evidence against people they wanted dead. So that's also very possible. And you could speculate about motivation across the board, right? But it is the critical piece that justice for the individual demands evidence. It's why the presumption of innocence is there. And that the moment we allow the mob's wishes about the supposed actions of past actors to determine their guilt without evidence, that we really get into trouble. And we're really kind of, there's people in the United States right now that want to do that. They want to go after people that were in the former president's administration just because they were associated with him or supported him. And to be quite fair, part of that was their job. So to find evidence of ethical misconduct and charge them is one thing. But to convict them by association publicly is quite another. And that is, to a degree, what happened to, to the Marquis de Favre. He was convicted by association publicly. It's just a dangerous thing. The English are crafty. We should go back in time one time when we're all done with this and just do the, the English Civil War. Because it's, it's nuts. The English Civil War is also nuts. Not as nuts as this, but it's nuts. So fears about plots such as this one involving Favre led, you know, whether they were real or imaginary plots, along with the secretive proceedings of groups like the Augustinians would fuel this paranoia of counter-revolutionary plots around every flippin' corner. And they would pave this easy downhill path for the Jacobins to take France to the Great Terror. Yeah, they had a civil war. Uh, Cavaliers and Roundheads. It's a very interesting civil war. Uh, about parliamentary responsibility and the king's reliance upon them and the heir of Oliver Cromwell is extremely interesting. Uh, we can come back around to it in like two years. Yeah, Charles II lost his head. Charles II, so let's talk about, that's actually a good thing that Rocket brought up Charles II. Charles II died because he was obstinate. He died because he had his, he was in this vein of, I am the king and I will never compromise what i want he was the polar opposite of louis the 16th louis the 16th was too compromising right he he just swung back and forth through whatever he thought or someone else had whispered into his ear was a thing to do for the day charles ii just stood there and said i mean they didn't want to cut his head off and he all he had to do was something really simple to keep his head and he was like Nope. Do it. The, he's the extreme polar opposite of Louis XVI. We can get into Charles II another day, but he is, it's emblematic because it's within 150 years of this. Well, it's within 200 years of this, you know, where they're kind of contemporaries where, in terms of being rulers, where one was one way, very much one way. And then there's Louis who, you know, can't really predict what Louis XVI is going to do. Today is 14, 15 pages. Keep it focused. I don't mind talking for a longer period tonight. I'm glad you guys enjoy this. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to go. It's actually almost 16. It's certainly 15 full pages. So around the time that Favre gets killed, he gets hung, the National Assembly hosted a plain clothed Louis XVI, remember, who knows what he's going to do next, um, on February 4th. So about, you know, 12, what, 14 days before Favre dies, Louis comes down to the Assembly and... and it's a royal session of the assembly, but there really was no protocol for that sort of thing. But he comes down plain clothes. He comes down with no retinue. He comes down with no, you know, attainders. He doesn't come down in the robes and pomp and circumstance. He comes down as, as a citizen king. And we're going to come back to this meeting as important shortly. But the key thing about this, this appearance by Louis is that he promises to uphold the Constitution during it. And the Constitution isn't written and, you know, complete yet. But... He basically comes down and says, yeah, whatever you guys come up with, I'm, I'm going to support it. It's going to create a problem um, for the right especially, but we'll get to that. But a couple days later, on February 13th, led by the Jacobins, the assembly voted to stop recognizing monastic vows 
in another swipe at the Catholic Church. So what this meant is that monks and nuns across France were no longer under any obligation to remain at their positions. You know, in the monasteries and the convents and nunneries. And the hope from the left, well, again, this is now being driven by the Jacobins. Look how little amount of time that took for them to really get the, the left corral. They really started organizing in November, and here they are in complete control of the left in February. And the hope was that this vote would free those who had become effectively prisoners to the church within the convents and monasteries, along with sweeping out all the freeloading members of these monastic orders who were living in these church bodies in solitude, basically feeding off the nation like parasites, right? Because they were all getting paid from what used to be the tithe, and they haven't replaced that yet. But the monastic orders were largely seen as parasitic. They weren't ministering to the general populace in the way, you know, parish priests were. What were they doing? Well, they sure were taking money. So, again, February 13th, 1790, Jacobin-led National Assembly says, let's get rid of them. We're no longer recognizing those vows as binding as a nation. And the really important thing is that the property of these monastic orders would comprise a major part of that 400 million livre authorization of church property back in November that the assembly had said, yeah, we're going to auction up to shore up the value of the enseignants. Let's get rid of them. This is a major factor, though, in convincing the middle of this assembly to support church nationalization, right? Because you had the left who was like, let's let's sweep aside all of it. And you had the right who was saying, the clergy was now on the right saying, whoa, whoa, you're dismantling the church. What are you doing? And then there was that middle that was like, I don't know about just taking property from the church, right? Because property was still that idea enshrined in the Declaration of the Rights of Man that was super important to the Declaration of the Rights of Man. But by not going directly at, you know, the more recognizable church buildings, they weren't going after churches, they were going after monasteries and convents, it made it more okay with the middle, and it got them on board with the idea of we're not washing off real church land. Only just the monasteries and the convents, which even those guys in the middle kind of saw in that same parasitic view. Like, yeah, they're just leeches anyway. We might as well sweep them aside. But then on March 6th, 1790, Nacare, because he's still hanging around, he's got a bajillion lives, I swear to God. Nacare comes down to the assembly with another, yet another, bleak financial outlook and says look i was here before you guys came down to paris and i told you what are you doing to fix the economy and yeah you know you're proposing to do all this stuff and some of these things have hit auction but it's not enough what you have done thus far the real money on paper and the books so far isn't enough to solve the problem and this is important because it really the cares presence in march 1790 at the early the early days of march forced the assembly to look in the mirror effectively and ask themselves, are we going to seriously begin the sacrilegious process of auctioning off church property or are we going to find another way? And about a month later, boom, month gone. April 9th, the debate comes to a head when two independent assembly subcommittees, because they have subcommittees, just like, you know, the U.S. Senate has subcommittees and the Parliament and UK has subcommittees. They both come forward. These two distinct and independent subcommittees of the assembly didn't share any members. They come forward calling for a decision on just how much of the church's property was really available to the nation to use. And they are effectively asking for a hard quantification of Talleyrand's one-third of church property. The effective question that these committees were asking was if the assembly was going to continue dancing around the semantics of all of this, or was church property well and truly going to be nationalized? And how they were also asking, how are we going to address the use of the enseignant? Because the enseignant, remember, is a bond. It is a bond that was used to pay creditors from this, this, you know, the, the state. The, the nation of France was paying banks and enseignant, these bonds, which they were intended to 
hey, turn around and use the enseignant to give us the value no added way. the best way, and we're going to give you the church's property in kind to settle our debts with you. But the Asignan had taken on legs as a, a de facto replacement currency for the livre. And on the street, it was being exchanged. And it came in 200 and 400 uh, livre notes. Uh, I believe that's accurate. But people were doing business in the Asignan and not the livre. Like large transactional business was being done in the Asignan. So what are we going to do? A as the assembly, are we going to recognize the Asignan as currency? And if we are... We have to make sure it's actually backed by something more than the conversation around whether or not this church property has actually been taken and is backing this bond. Because if it is great, you know, then the Ancien is relatively solvent. But if it's not, we don't actually have the property to back the Ancien. And there's people out there conducting business on it. They'll be like having no, you know, we had a gold standard in the U.S. for a long time. And technically, we're still on the gold standard, but not really. But in those days, if there was not a materiel backing currency, the currency had no value. Yeah. So again, put their money where their mouth was. Are you going to do this or not? So it's going to be like the Confederate dollar. I mean, yeah, the Confederate dollar was hyperinflated because they just simply printed it forever. They, the Confederate dollar was printed to, to show that there was a dollar that was not the Union dollar. And there was nothing to back it up. Um, and the, the U.S. dollar in its early days didn't have a, a gold standard. And the, the whole reason it's called the pound sterling in the U.K. is because its basic value way back was backed by one pound sterling. You know, one pound of sterling of silver. <laughs> That's why it's called that. But yeah, so the idea is that the Alcyon, you need to back it with something because people are using it as money. Whether it is church property or something else, come up with an answer. At this point, the Jacobins argued for full 100%, not one third percent, but 100% nationalization of all church property. But they were arguing for it for more than it just being a financial crisis. The Jacobins also were arguing that the first estate needed to be entirely demolished. If the nation was going to come together as one, it's one of the, again, you can feel Robespierre in that because it's vague. The virtuous concept of the, of the single nation as one is certainly coming out of his head because he, he thinks that way. I've, I've read a lot of what this guy has written and he believes optimistically that that is possible. That the unified... Make sure you're there next Saturday. Let's reach out and he believes it's possible for a nation to work together to a common goal harmoniously. And I think that anybody, anywhere, who has studied human nature knows that just, that can't be done. People, people are too selfish for that at times. Too self-interested for that to be true. But the Jacobin argument emulated Robespierre's thinking. And they believed that the first estate just needed to go... Bye-bye. They needed to be gone in order for this grand unification of the French people to occur. And they also argued, the Jacobins, that the church was effectively running its own private empire within our kingdom. That, and they had been for a long time. And that's true. That the, the, the Vatican-led Catholic Church for centuries, and you could argue into today, leads pr a private worldwide empire that exists within the boundaries of all nations. Yeah, it doesn't just ask the same thing. It's still true. And the Jacobins argued that that was not okay. That that was not going to work anymore. That this, this pseudo shadow empire that existed kind of like in parallel with the actual national government had to go away. And then others, not the Jacobins, chimed in that nationalization would be beneficial to the church as it would shine the light on the corrupt aristocrats and clergy who had their hands deep in the church's coffers and had simply been enriching themselves from it. <clears throat> Tally Rand. But it would shine a light and make that corruption stop. And yet others argued that nationalizing the church was a good way to ensure the success of the revolution. Because anyone who purchased church lands via the Ancien or at auction 
would have a vested revolution, an interest in the revolution succeeding, right? Because the claim to their title on that property would be entirely invested in the success of the assembly remaining legitimate and the constitution that the assembly produces being legitimate. So anyone who bought property would be basically buying into the revolution. So the Augustinians obviously took up the opposing view, right? Because the Augustinians were the arch conservatives and the clergy. And they started arguing that property was sacred. And the Declaration of the Rights of Man enshrined the notion that property was sacred. Especially church property. And then they made the salient point that if you take all this property and then just flood the market with it, the church's property will de value will deflate. You know, you won't get what you think you're going to get if you just try to flood the market with everything the church owns. The value will deflate because the man won't be there and it won't be worth anything near the true value. And then they also made the argument that besides that, besides you're not going to get much bang for your buck here, you're kind of selling your soul to, you know, this is this is an arrangement that you're selling your immortal soul in order to blow up the church, destroy the first estate, maybe nobly try to save the financial state of, the, of France as a kingdom. But whatever you're doing, this way of doing it is a more it's immoral. Yeah, that's some exact next point, Dustin. Seems like a bunch of them didn't believe in souls. While the Augustinians were likely using this language of piety to their advantage. The clerical delegates and some of those in the middle actually were concerned about the fate of the church and their souls. So the Augustinians were, you know, art conservative nobles that just wanted their the way of life back. You know, their way of life is just it's a crazy my way of life. It's a crazy concept that is repetitive through history and legitimization for all manner of crazy things going down. But the Augustinians Mads with five tier one subs to Barl's Cabbage, which is a take on Charles Babbage, BRH72, Concert, Mojo, Genogen Yard, and The Fabled One. The Fabled One. It's a good one to give. Woo woo! So again, the Augustinians were certainly leveraging the language of piety. They didn't. They were exactly as, as cynical as Dustin was up there. Terry with a resub. Tier 1, 12 months. Thank you very much. The Augustinians were certainly using this language of piety to kind of say, hey, look. We might not believe in the eternal soul, but you do. Look at what you're doing. But the rest of them, you know, the middle and certainly the clerical delegates, a lot of them anyway, because we've demonstrated there are plenty of atheists within the Catholic Church. Um, but the clerical delegation certainly believed it. So in an effort to find a compromise, a member of the Jacobins, and I don't have the name, I just know it occurred, who was also a devout Catholic, that's a weird combination because there he is all the way over on the left, but believes in the Catholic Church sincerely proposed that the Catholic Church become the official religion of the state, of the Kingdom of France. And it technically wasn't, even though it really wasn't great to be a Protestant, it wasn't the state religion yet. And this, this sent the debate into a completely different spiral where the, the level of rancor and animosity of what was being said just went up. And I've always considered the language of politics to be civility, that compromise is dictated in tone, and choice of words. You can, the whole idea of you make, you can get more with honey than you can with vinegar. But when political discourse enters into a rancorous accusatory, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm not willing to listen to you state, like we have today, it can get real bad. And that's the tone it shifts to when it is proposed in the assembly by a member of the Jacobins that the Catholic Church become the official state religion. It, it just becomes bitter. It becomes far more bitter in the debate of the assembly than it ever had been. The left is in there accusing the right of helping hypocrites in the church bankrupt a nation, which is partially true. And the right is accusing the left of greed I don't know. I don't buy that. I don't think they were acting out of greed and sacrilege. And I guess it depends on your perspective because sacrilege is subjective. 
Now, do you think that the taking of church lands is sacrilege? Probably if you're a devout Catholic, you do. If you're an atheist, you probably don't. But these words flew across the middle of the assembly. You know, you're empowering greedy, you know, corruption within the church that is benefiting you. Oh, well, you just want to make money off it. I really don't think the Jacobins were looking to personally make money off of the sale of the Catholic Church. I believe their true intent was simply to blow it up. Like they saw it as a power competitor more than anything. So at the end of the debate that had become so nasty, the Jacobins engineer an adjournment. And in the wake of that adjournment and that escalated debate, they plotted some strategy and they came up with a plan. And the next day they introduced a motion that such a majestic thing as the Catholic Church, note the language, such a majestic thing as the Catholic Church, who we hate and want to get rid of, could not be legislated by the assembly as the national religion, but would be in turn favored in the new constitutional order. It's language, right? We go back to how Mirabeau got the initial Talleyrand measure through. It was by changing the wording. And these words matter because it mollifies those people who are like, wait a minute, what do you want to do? Oh, okay, that sounds better. It's the same damn thing, but it sounds better. And this appeased just enough members in that middle to get the motion passed the next day that fully nationalized the French Catholic Church. So we've gone from one third of church property is enough to shore up the financial crisis in October 1789 to April 1790, and the French National Assembly just said all of it is national property. Six months. It's a pretty radical swing. And the Jacobins demonstrate in this how absolutely crafty they are. They got everything they wanted, gave up nothing by changing 10 words pay attention to what people say to you because those who know what they're doing can be extremely extremely manipulative or manipulative simply in their word choice and the jacobins are going to demonstrate this over and over and over this passage sent conservative delegates for the doors of the assembly. They literally began to resign or boycott attending the assembly. And this, okay, so we're now in a situation where the Monarchians are gone. The Augustinians had come up to kind of challenge for that center, center right group. And here's the Jacobins steamrolling. And then in April, a lot of what constitutes the Augustinian says, I'm done. Who's that leave? It leaves the Jacobins. Yeah, there's delegates that aren't Jacobin members, but the Jacobins are organized and they don't have a challenger at this moment. With these large swaths of conservatives not coming to the assembly due to their choice to boycott proceedings or they outright resigned, there were still enough members of the assembly for a quorum. And the Jacobins began to pass motion after motion further, just moving this nationalization of the church and its property and reorganizing the ASEAN as official currency by staggeringly huge majorities. And the thing is, is that the Catholic Church was not popular in large civic centers of enlightenment like Paris, right? Where they saw the church as a tool of dogmatic suppression of the the undereducated but out in the provinces supposedly you know the catholic church was super popular and it was and what was playing in paris wasn't going to play well out in the provinces and the, the jacobins were constantly cautioned about this like hey this looks great to you here but what's going to happen out in you know bordeaux and Brittany and the vendee because those people aren't going to react well to what you've done to the church. And that's true, right? That That is exactly how the provinces are going to react. They're going to be like, what? But 
initially the Jacobins get they start receiving letters from the provinces in support of what they had just done, which takes everyone by surprise. What do you mean? Everyone out there likes it. And these letters would embolden the Jacobins to attempt to make the church even more subservient to the nation in the Constitution. But these letters were almost for sure. Remember to clonk that follow button. The work of the committees of correspondence out in those provincial Jacobin clubs, writing back in saying, hey, we think in our club, what you're doing is great. And it gives this false impression that the rural population of France was behind the Jacobins when they weren't. So we are going to move into the next section. And I am on page eight of my notes now. We're going to talk about here are the Jacobins. Ascendant, right? They have power. No one opposes them. The Munarchians are largely gone and the Augustinians exist, but they just lost a bunch of people from the assembly because they're done. And just as the Jacobins have their hand on power, the left breaks down and splits. We're going to get into that split and why it happened and what the aftermath was after a break. So hang out, but stand up, get a drink. Uh, yeah, we're about halfway done. <laughs> or almost two hours in, about halfway done. I told you it was a big episode. Uh, maybe a little bit longer than I first anticipated, but that's fine. Because I need to get to summer 1790 before we come back from my birthday. So stand up, get a drink at the bathroom, all that stuff. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you very much, Mads, for the five gift subs. For the anonymous 20 gift subs earlier. For all of your resubs, Terry, everyone else who's hosted. Thank you all. All of that supports the AV. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stretch your legs, get a drink, and I'll talk to you in a few.
I see it, Matt. Yeah, that's a good idea. I want to do it. I just have to come up with the wording. Maybe, maybe next weekend we can write down some ideas on paper. <coughs> Station! Station! So before we get go go back, uh, there's a lot of people in here now, and I made this shout out earlier, but um, go give VT a follow. Um, everyone else gets their you know shout outs when they come in, and we largely follow each other already. Yeah, that too. Next Saturday in place of me at noon, you know, Mega Charity, go hang out there, but go give VT's link a click real quick if you don't mind. Um, for a couple reasons. One, uh, I like hanging out in there with him and Dagger because uh, they co-stream stories, Monster Hunter stories. They co-stream Monster Hunter. They, they have this really cool setup where you can see both of them. Uh, and then VT does his, his streaming too. But uh, it is very much a Big Top Outlaws-like channel to be in where it is a come as you are, take no BS. We're not looking to make everybody, you know, we're not playing to everyone's damn sensibilities. It, it, it is intelligent. It's a cool place to hang out, and yeah, go hang out. Um, schedule is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I believe, with Friday being a Monster Hunter Rise community night for at least one more week. But certainly go over there, give ET follow. Everyone else in here, like Sturf, Terry streams, Diggity streams, Rocket streams, Dustin streams, Crackle streams, Manny streams, Mads on her birthday streams. Who else in there? Argo and Cat stream. Everyone kind of follows everyone else. I know the shout outs fire, but VT's kind of new. So I wanted to make sure that there was a special emphasis to go over there and say, you know, at least hang out, see what it's like. It's got some really great graphical elements. I know you guys have liked that about my streams in the past. So just head on over there. But as I said, we are about halfway through the outline, a little past, a little bit past halfway. There are 13 questions at the end, including one multi-parter. So have your stream loose cards in mind when we get to that point. If you don't have your free pack, there you go. Go get that as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So we talked about how the Jacobins had come back you know, come to exist and then had grabbed the momentum really quickly and sort of driven a nail in the conservatives really fast. But throughout the spring and into the summer of 1790, the delegates of the assembly worked really long hours. They worked seven days a week trying to figure out this new constitution for France. And they discovered that every issue they took up was entangled with every other issue and as they were trying to untangle things, they took up matters they never really intended to, like who had war and peace powers and the idea of judicial reform and the idea of hereditary and noble rights. And then they would come back around again to the Catholic Church. And it is during this period that the Jacobins rise, during the Jacobins rise, that the fulcrum of politics will again shift within the assembly, into the hands of the Marquis de Lafayette and his fellow liberal noble friends. Remember, we talked about how one of the reasons the revolution just keeps on chugging is because of the size of the assembly, right? There's over 1,200 members, at least at the start, and there's no consolidated block that has the majority. It's why I don't think parliamentary compromised governments work very well, because they're all based in this kind of unstable bargain that keeps a government in power. And that's true here, where just no one could grab and hold the reins long enough, and the Jacobins, even as quickly as they grabbed power, they lose it. So conservatives were in terminal decline at this point, right? They were boycotting or had resigned from the assembly. Uh, in the move to Paris, the left becomes ascendant. The formation of the structures that the Jacobins adopted in early 1790. But the problem is that this left, the Jacobins comprised the radical left, but the left was just this broad range of views across all subjects. So as soon as they had power, they fractured on where to go with it. There were progressives who were to the right of the centrist Monarchians who were nowhere near as radical. Sorry, there were progressives who were to the left of who used to be the centrist monarchians who are now nowhere near as radical as those running the show on the jack the jacobin uh, steering committee so we're going to go back to february and i said this was going to be important in the, in the last section where the king came down to the assembly and gave that speech on the 4th of february and he pledged to uphold the constitution of france in whatever shape it took right and remember he attended in plain clothes he had no retinue no ceremony no attainders and 
in terms of Louie, this seems to be one of those moments where he literally was genuinely accepting what had happened in the last nine months and was kind of reconciling himself to this new order of things. And he was effectively under house arrest as a citizen king. But what was the alternative for him? Remember, this is before Favre is dead, based on that conspiracy with the Comte de Provence. Louis is already down in the assembly saying, yeah, I'll support whatever you guys come up with. And in doing so, he undercut the conservative position, right? His acceptance of the Constitution just took away this linchpin of conservative action as they rolled into the spring and then the nationalization of the church. The, the, the conservatives within the Augustinians were just arguing for the old way. And the king just came out on August, or February 4th and said, I'm going to accept the new way. Whatever it's written down as a constitution, I've got my suspensive veto, right? We've agreed to that. I'll accept what you guys put down on paper. And he just sweeps the legs out from underneath the conservatives. It's not the first time he's done it. Remember, he swept out Mounier's legs about the unilateral full veto. And I think that was a politically savvy move back in August of 1789. But, or, or September 1789. But Louis just basically says, and I don't think he's resigned. I just think he says, yeah. This is the way things are, and I, I'm i a citizen king. I, I have to go with this, so I will accept it. But it also splintered the left. Many of the delegates had been held together by this fear of the counter-revolutionary attack, right? And there was still this fear. You know, the Augustinians and whatever house they were meeting in tonight were certainly still plotting ways to do it. And then you had the, you had the, the king's brothers who were certainly plotting ways to restore the crown to its glory. Comte d'Artois for sure, because he's out of France at this point. You know, he's holding court in exile. But the king's acceptance of this, this current status quo and whatever the constitution would become took the fear out of a lot of the less radical delegates. I mean, they're never going to please the people that are the extreme radicals because they're always going to just see the king and the existence of the king as a source for potential counter-revolutionary activity. But the middle and the more progressive left middle delegates, like the liberal nobles, saw the king's acceptance as a, hmm, maybe there's not going to be a counter-revolution. These moderate left delegates had always wanted to work with the king. His waffling had made it impossible. You know, they, they had wanted to be partners with the king. And the king was now saying, here, I'm I'm gonna I'm willing to make a deal. I'm willing to say, yeah, let's do this. And they really wanted to take his hand and do it. They wanted to work with this legislative body and the executive citizen king and make it work, which is kind of where the constitution was going. But the more radical delegates were never going to trust the king. They, they didn't trust him, and they were never going to trust him. They did not want to work with him. The only, the only thing that was feasible for them right now was to just put him in a box and tell him what to do. So just as the new Jacobin Club was coming into its own, based on the power of their systemic structure and the sweeping out of the resigned and boycotting conservatives, they fractured. And for the rest of 1790, it would look like the Jacobins were not the radical future of France, and they certainly are. But it would look like they were a dead end of ultra-radicalism, whose views were so extreme that they were just as doomed to failure as the arch-conservative you know, perspective's view had been. It just proven to be that the... To, it would be, it's, it's bad to say radical conservative, but arch conservative is how I've been phrasing it. Arch conservative and ultra radical are just the same idea on different sides of a spectrum. No way! Yes, way! The arch conservative cause is largely dead. And right now, when this fracture occurs, the radical, the extreme radical side of the Jacobins is also kind of going to feel dead. And what happens is this thing comes about called the Society of 1789, the Middle Row Guys. It was politically formed from members of the Jacobins in reaction to the king's outreach and prim primarily comprised of liberal nobles like the Marquis de Lafayette. You can see Talleyrand's down there and Mirabeau will eventually be one and Jacques-Pierre Brissot. 
Jacques Pierre Brissot is eventually going to be the primary impetus for revolution, the wars, but he's not there yet. And it really began as a social club. It was a social club of liberal nobles who began to meet with each other informally after they all moved back to Paris, independent of the Jacobins. And almost all of the members of the Society of 1789 had joined the Jacobins when the Jacobins formed. Prominent members at the early formation of the Society were the Abbe C.S., on top of the people we have listed here, the Marquis de Condorcet, and other like-minded fellows who, if you remember the Society of 30 back in 1788, who had you know, printed pamphlets to fill up the CARES inbox and empower the Third Estate, that club, which was originally built by Adrian Dupour, a lot of those guys are who come in and form this social club, eventually political faction known as the Society of 17 but critically, Dupour did not. Dupour was a founding and still believing in member of the Jacobins at this point. He does not join the Society of 1789. But after the King's speech in February, the liberal nobles started to see the next threat to this enlightened order that had kind of been established was not coming from the conservatives. It was going to come from the arch, ultra-radical side of the Jacobins when the Jacobins didn't also say to the king, yeah, let's work together. When they saw that, they said, you know, they wanted to work with the king. The liberal nobles wanted to say, yes, let's, let's work together. The Jacobins basically gave Louis the finger. The Society of 1780 said, wait a minute. We've been looking, you know, to the right the whole time. Right. Stage right. But the problem's not over there anymore. Those guys are gone, largely. They don't have any juice anymore. What are they doing? And so, the first big split comes in March with, from within the Jacobins. Like, the, the liberal nobles are kind of already going, wait a minute, what's going on? But the first big motivational split comes in March 1790 when the argument from within the Jacobins started over who could be a member of the Jacobins. Now remember, there are clubs springing up all over France. The Committee of Correspondence is working with these, these provincial clubs to create this party, this national constituency of a party. And here we are, the Central Committee run by Robespierre, Dupour, Barnave, and Lamette were very happy to open membership to anyone who could pay the dues. No crap. For lots of reasons. One, they were strong, stronger than the assembly. They were better network. They had clubs everywhere that they were working with. And anyone who can pay means more money for what they were doing. Liberal nobles thought the membership should just be the men who were in the assembly, only delegates. And the key function from the perspective of the liberal nobles was that the Jacobins had been built in the mold of the Munarchians to hand down voting instructions to shape policy as a you know a group, to form a, a voting block. They, they saw that as the limit of what the Jacobins should be. But as the Jacobins began to say anybody could be a member, including every Joe out there in the province who wants to slap on the name Jacobin and work with us, this, this rift opens. The open membership poly was, policy was officially adopted in March and caused some Jacobins, such as the Comte de Crillon, to walk out and start their own club, not the, the, the Society of 1789, but just their, they, their own attempt at a new club. And a few weeks after the adoption of this, anybody can be a member of the Jacobins policy, Lafayette stops attending Jacobin meetings for basically the same reasons, that he believes that membership should be restricted to just the delegates and then the, the large outreach to any Joe out in the provinces and the audience who could afford it to be a Jacobin was not what he envisioned. And he saw the danger in that. A lot of them did because it comes back to the audience, right? The audience is now no longer just who's in the live political theater of the Jacobin club every night. It's who's in the audience of all of the Jacobin clubs where all of the debates are happening. And if those people, those radicals who, because the mobs are pretty radical, are in the audiences can buy into the club and shape not just with their voice of dissent or approval from the rafters, but from within the debate, that radical voice is extremely dangerous, and the liberal nobles saw that as the new threat. So Lafayette left because of the above reasons, but he also really didn't like Lamette. 
Alexander de Lamette was one of three brothers who had fought in the American Revolution alongside Lafayette. Two of them can come back pretty radical and one had come back pretty conservative. But La Lamette saw Lafayette as this just simply a self-aggrandizing egoist who Lamette never trusted. And it's, it's kind of true. Lafayette certainly believed in his own importance. But again, Lafayette was an idealist in what was a pretty cynical state of affairs in France. And Lafayette saw Lamette as an opportunist who wanted to replace him as commander of the National Guard, and that was certainly true. So by April, the Society of 1789 had shifted. They existed before this vote had happened, but they shifted from being a social club where they just kind of talked about things to a true political club where they had dues and order and rules and a basic agenda which was designed to ensure the survival of this constitutional monarchy that they had been building, building, and which was based in what was in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was Lafayette's baby, remember? So composed, it was composed of mostly, again, liberal nobles, Mirabeau, Talleyrand, Bailly, um, and then a writer and a man of business for the Duke d'Orléans. I mean, that's a name we haven't heard in a while, but remember, the Duke d'Orléans is also a member of the Berman family, Louis' cousin, and Jacques-Pierre Brissot, worked with the Duke d'Orléans. And the Duke d'Orléans was this black sheep in terms of Louis' perspective and his brothers, where you know he was one of the first enablers of the free press at the Palais Royal. And he was accused of enabling the revolution to try to get the crown and the, the throne for himself. So here's Brissot, who worked with the Duke d'Orléans, joining the Society of 1789. And as of late spring, most of the members of the Society of 1789 continued to hold membership in both the Society and the Jacobins. But they would pretty soon be forced to pick a side. And tensions rose as spring turned to summer, and the ties that held this coalition of the left, right, the ultra and then less radical radicals of the Jacobins, it ruptured. And it ruptured when the Assembly took up two matters in May 1790. The first one of those was judicial reform. So let's set the French Wayback Machine to the Parlement, remember? The Parlement, as we rolled up to the revolution, was the check, right? The supposed protector of the people and whatever. But they were the check on the king's power. He could uh, refute and send back things back to the king they didn't like they would remonstrate them and say nope fix this or explain it better remember those guys the parlement firing up the way back that works dustin that's good over the winter of 1789 1790 the assembly and so we've taken a step back now we're back from april back to you know back from may back to the winter back to where we started tonight and the assembly had suspended all function of the parlement like everywhere the Parlement had kind of existed still judicially as that high court of appeal until right around this episode. It was because the assembly decided that having this organized body of magistrates run to judiciary who had obtained their positions, you know, through, you know, office purchase, privilege, or inheritance from their, their father was just simply counter to the concepts of the revolution. You couldn't have this notion of privilege be the basis for who was a judge of the regional Supreme Court. The rule of law in the eyes of the, the assembly was just paramount to the importance of all of everything. So the system of entitlement running the judiciary was simply not going to work. So in early November, they were suspended in all form and function. And if you remember, the people used to defend the Parlement, right? They, the people believed the Parlement stood for them. And now, 1789, November, nobody, zero people care that the Parlement has basically been put in box in mothballs and said, no more. So we go from November 1789 to May 1790 without really a judicial system in France, and the Assembly finally takes up the question of what to do, how are we going to replace them? So Adrian Dupour, you know, remember Adrian Dupour was in the Paris Parlement, with the Premonial, when Brienne brought down the output of the Assembly of Notables and said, here, we have to pass all of this stuff to financially reform France. Remember, Dupour was there. He was leading the resistance to all things from the king to get to the Estates General. So now 
Dupour has the experience and he leads the question. And he takes that lead just having been at the forefront of the judicial events for so long. Remember, he was a, a lawyer and a well-respected magistrate. And he drew up a plan calling for the democratization of the entire legal system where all judges should be elected. Juries should hear civil cases, which we take for granted, right? We have juries sit on most civil cases today in the U.S. for sure, but that juries should sit in judgment on civil cases, which they didn't in France at the time. And a lot of times didn't sit in judgment of criminal cases either. And again, this, the whole notion, remember the Jacobins stand for equality for all, which meant all laws were applicable to everyone, everywhere, regardless of wealth or social status. And this thing, this point has been pounded on repetitively, but not codified in law that you can't have your own private court. You know, rich people used to, not so far in the past in France, but those things just didn't work. They were, they were just counter to how the revolution, how the revolution was going. It was counter to the principles of 1789, it was counter to the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and it just couldn't exist. All laws had to apply everywhere. And if you remember, remember to clonk that follow besides button. Besides clonking that follow button, when we talked about how crazy the French judicial system was when we started this series. If you go back and remember, lines, lines everywhere, lines. Because there was a system where one guy standing next to another guy in the same city couldn't be sure he was subject to the same laws. This was just to do away with all of that because they wanted to get it into the constitution that this is the way the legal system worked. And Dupont took this to the delegates. They balked. They balked because it was sweepingly democratic. I believe everything Dupont wanted to do was in the best interest of the people. But remember the notion of outright equality was rejected in the definition of active versus passive citizen and the concept of ownership in the system. Even rank-and-file Jacobins broke ranks and voted against this. Like, the steering committee puts it out and says support it, and the Jacobins themselves say, uh-uh, we're not going for that. You're trying to make the law, you're trying to make everybody equal. Which is kind of crazy, because one of the things you had to believe in to be a member of the Jacobins was equality for all. So, when we're talking about legal equality for all, and some of the Jacobins break, some, something's fishy, right? On the critical question of whether the king would have a veto over, I think my earbud just died. Let me switch over here. Let me switch over to my headphones. Pretty sure my wireless earbud just died. You see, I think my other one will work. Somebody do something. Uh, otherwise, I'll switch over. Uh, let me test real quick before we get going. Nope, it went through my headphones. Nope, there we go. I'm good. It's back in this year now, which is why I only use one at a time. Because, hey, look, the episode's too long and my battery died. So on the critical question of whether the king would have a veto over judicial appointments, the Jacobins barely hold it together to vote no and say no. The king cannot override a judicial official who's elected. It was obvious, though, where the defections within the Jacobins were coming from. The Society of... Those members of the Society of 30, who are now, you know, the Society of 1789 plus some, um, were now clearly running from the extreme radical side of the Jacobins and toward the king. And this takes us into the discussion over the power to declare, to declare war. A few days following this debate on judicial reform in May, the rumblings of war actually began to rise between England and Spain, which further served to illustrate this schism that was occurring within the radicals, within, well, not the radicals, but within the left. There was a long-standing alliance between France and Spain at this point in history because it was rooted in the fact that both France and Spain were ruled by branch, branch members of the Bourbon dynasty. And no one knew who could declare war, how, what, and on whom in the wake of everything that's kind of happened in the revolution. So Louis does what he thinks he should do as a king. He unilaterally issues orders for French warships to begin to prepare for potential engagement with England, which is something that kings have been empowered to do for pretty much time immemorial. And war and, war and peace had been forever the business of a king, of a monarch. And it was assumed 
by Louis and a lot of people that everyone could basically agree on that. And the Society of 1789 was willing to entertain this interpretation by the king, and they pushed a measure through the assembly that retroactively ratified what Louis had just done, but it still didn't settle the question. The far left Jacobins, the, the extreme radical Jacobins, wanted no part of empowering the king to declare war and peace. They had come to believe that the assembly was the, the, the sovereign government of France, and therefore they were the only body who had war powers. So from May 15th through the 22nd, the debate within the National Assembly just raged over the question of who had powers of war and peace. And even the rapidly declining conservatives weighed in on this matter, and they proposed that the king should have sole discretion in matters of war and peace, which was kind of what Louis was saying he had. And the radical Jacobins retorted that the only the assembly should have this authority. And the center left was left wide open, right? So we had this opening where the Munarchians left, and they left the center, the center right, but the center wide open. And the Augustinians kind of came in and grabbed it for a little while until they decided they were done. And here we are again, the center is left wide open for compromise between the extreme positions of the king should have full authority and the assembly should have full authority. And so here come the Society of 1789. They step into the middle and they propose a compromise that the matters of war and peace for the state should be decided jointly. And this is the moment. Remember, the Comte de Mirabeau sits on the executive steering committee of the Jacobins, and he came out in support of this mixed system. He had served as one of the rotating presidents of the Jacobins in early 1790. So he shows at this moment in time that he's one of the liberal nobles, that he is one of, he believes more in what the Society of 1789 does than what the Jacobins do. And the compromise formula was the form that carried the day. This idea that the assembly and the king had to agree on war and peace. And it's kind of how things work today in the U.S. Like the president of the United States cannot declare a war. The Congress of the U.S. declares a war. And the Congress of the U.S. must also ratify any treaty that's negotiated by the Department of State of the U.S. So there is this hybrid system that we have in the U.S. now. It wasn't as detailed as that at the time in France because they hadn't written it all down in the Constitution yet, but that's kind of where they were going. Thankfully for everybody, though, the war powers just were not tested in this moment. It did prove, however, that the liberal nobles who had... We'll see you shortly, Dustin. But it did prove that the liberal nobles who had long seen themselves as the natural leaders of the revolution were all of a sudden in the driver's seat in the assembly, right? They had, they had stolen the initiative from an increasingly radicalized left faction of the Jacobins driven back to the center toward the King and grabbed the momentum. So this is when the rift widens to its probable maximum extent and then kind of settles off. Shortly after the victory in the war powers, the Society of 1789 backed the Abbe C.S. for the president's chair of the assembly, which was this one of those you know, monthly rotating presiding officer positions. And it was over who the chosen candidate of the Jacobins were, was, and C.S. won. C.S. won the rotating presidency. And in the wake of this, Talleyrand and Mirabeau both just walk out of the Jacobins and they never come back. And a lot of other people do the same thing. They see where the power was and it wasn't with the Jacobins and they abandoned the Jacobins. The momentum at this point, <clears throat> excuse me, is now squarely with the Society of 1789. And they further strengthened their position by offering associate member status within the club to delegates of the National Assembly who could not afford the steep costs that they had kind of set on dues for the really, really rich nobles who had initially made up their membership role. And soon they had about 160 delegates on their rolls, including most of the delegates who had left the Jacobins in March. Remember when they first left over the membership problem? This left the weakened Jacobin, Jacobin club with almost the same number. So you have 160 in the middle, 160 on ish on the far left, and then a pretty vacant right. The walkouts from this moment hit the Jacobins really hard. 
they had gone from being extremely powerful and boasting a lot of members within the National Assembly to being whittled down to 150-ish. And despite the left now having been split into two camps, this did not mean that they disagreed on everything. And in June 1790, they would work together to address those men who formerly comprised both the first and second estate. And this is bringing us to the death of the first and second estate. The estates had been this concept that separated people into castes based on those who pray, those who fight, and those who work. With the first estate being prey and the second estate being the nobles who fight and the third estate being, hey, everybody else, 93% of the population. So after the closing arguments over the matters of war powers in May, the assembly took up the debate over the future of both the aristocracy and the clergy in June 1790. And we'll start with the second estate, the nobles. So go back to the night of August the 4th, 1789, when the end of nobility or the end of feudalism in France kind of came out of nowhere. And the same thing kind of happens to end nobility in France. <clears throat> On August, I'm sorry, June 19th, the Jacobins decide to kind of stage an impromptu piece of theater within the assembly where men of various nationalities paraded into the assembly in their native garb to laud the assembly for the rights they had just given to men of all nationalities over the past year. And these were actually just paid actors who had rented costumes from the Paris Opera to get their native garb. But following this stage disruption, a real disruption manifested when a delegate on his own, under no direction from any club, moved that in keeping with the universal equality of man that had just been applauded by all the delegates present, that all hereditary titles should be abolished. You're talking hereditary titles like the Marquis de Lafayette and the Comte de Mirabeau and the Comte de Provence. Those titles should just be abolished. This broke the dam the same way that the motions on August 4th, 1789 had kind of broke the dam and people just wanted to do one more thing. Most of the delegates, mainly liberal nobles from the Society of 1789, rushed in to denounce their own marks of noble status like coats of arms and special liveries and inherited titles and any social distinction that they enjoyed based on their nobility. Conservatives obviously tried to halt this flood, those who were left, pointing out that the routine of the assembly had now been firmly established, that to, to consider national matters, which this was during the day session, and that more provincial and minor matters were an evening session thing, and they had had no place in the evening session in which this was being discussed. And they were right. That had become the flow of the National Assembly at this point. The suppression of hereditary rights was certainly a, session, a national matter and had no place being debated here. However, don't forget again, the audience. The audience is there as they always were and as ever present as they always were for all proceedings of the assembly. They cheered the nobles who were giving up or vote, saying, hey, let's give up these representations of systematic oppression that had been a basis for the three estates. They booed and catcalled the conservatives who were trying to preserve as much of the old status quo and in the eyes of the audience, the old mechanisms of greed and oppression. And when the votes finally came in and all this, it was a landslide in favor of renouncing and abolishing pretty much all mechanisms of no nobility and members of the National Assembly would change their names from Marquis de Lafayette, they stopped using their title to Gilbert de Montier. But I'm going to keep calling him the Marquis de Lafayette simply for consistency, right? Like the titles are going to come back eventually. And just for the purposes of ha the guy having the same name, we're going to go with that. It's going to get even more confusing when the French calendar isn't the Roman calendar anymore in a couple of years, but we'll get there. Conservatives, again, appalled, right? They had already given up their feudal rights. And they were now barred from using those things which had made them special in a system that was largely over and done with. The absence of these social trinkets that they had relied upon to demonstrate that they were better than the commoners 
would lead to a significant uptick in noble emigration out of France. These nobles could not live in a kingdom they no longer recognized, which did not respect their honor and their identities. And in the hindsight of 2020 in history, years later, many who were present and not present would lament this night, this night of June 19, 1790, as a night when restraint, I'm sorry, restrained, but resigned conservatives, right? These were conservatives in the assembly and all over France were just kind of like, man, they're taking away our stuff and it uh, sucks to be me right now. I'm still rich and I mean, I've got all this stuff still, but I, mean, I just want things to be the way they were. They went from that mindset to being, no, now I'm going to actively oppose what's happening. These emigres would leave and just like the Comte, um, the Comte d'Artois, they would actively begin to work against the revolution. This was bad for the revolution. So if we had just kind of let them keep their thing and really didn't care what that thing meant, it probably would have would not have meant so much foreign resistance down the road. But then the assembly takes up the again issue of the Catholic Church and the first estate. The first estate's tithes had been abolished, its property had been confiscated, and its monastic orders had been suppressed. So what would be built up to replace it? How is the Vatican taking this, by the way? And that's what we're going to talk about Pope Pius VI. That guy in the upper left of your map. In March, the Pope had already condemned the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the steady assault on the autonomy of the Catholic Church in France, where he which he declared that everything that had been going on with respect to the Church was simply incompatible with true Catholicism. And then this is where we're going to zoom in on this little place called Avignon. If you'll notice, Avignon is inside the French frontier. But it's a papal enclave at this point in time in history. Avignon belongs to the Pope. That name is now familiar. <laughs> Avignon was this papal enclave. existed well within the frontier. And there were agitators within Avignon from its citizens that they wanted to be annexed into France proper. Riots broke out within the Pope. Yep, riots broke out with pro-France annexationists winning control of the city of Avignon. And the National Assembly wasn't stupid, right? They, they were well aware that they were pushing the limits of the Pope, that they had been poking the Pope for a while now, and they were not in a rush to annex Avignon yet. There were fears that the Pope, in retaliation, would declare some holy war and if you remember to the east is this empire called the holy roman empire they still answered to the pope so relationships between france and the vatican had been governed for about 275 years by this thing called the concordant of bologna it dated back to 1516 and it governed many things but in what's important here is it gave the right of appointment of high church officials in France to the king of France, way back in 1516. But the pope had the power to confirm those appointments, which effectively gave the pope a veto, that if he didn't like who the French king had appointed, that he could say, uh-uh, not that guy. It was very rarely used, but it, it was a power the pope had, and it was symbolic of crown deferment to the Pope's ultimate authority over the clergy in France, right? The debate over the future of the church lasted for pretty much the entire month in June, and it found the Jacobins and the 1789ers to be largely in agreement about what to do. So this debate was not as contentious as early matters in May, and seriously not as contentious as things would be when the months looking had happened back between the conservatives and the radicals. The debate here would result in something very momentous, a document called the Civil Constitution of the Clergy. It would not be formally adopted by the Assembly until June 12th, but the document would prove yes way. Thank you, Rocket. The document would prove itself to be, over time, fatal to the civil unity of the French nation. Didn't hear the no way? Okay. Interesting. 
Um, let me come over here um, and go to my headphones real quick and then see if you guys hear that. Otherwise, we might have to deal without audio for the rest of the stream. And let me try one thing to make sure it works. Let's go over here. That's interesting. Let's go here. Nope. You guys hear that? No, probably not. Well, crapola. There may be no more sound the rest of the stream except for me talking. At least that's the important part. I don't want to cut the VOD in the middle just to get that back. Yeah. Yeah, what happened is when I lost the earbud, it lost the source. I can still hear the sounds being played, but you can't, and that sucks. But we don't have that much further to go, so we'll deal with it for now, and maybe I'll switch back to using the wire bud to avoid this in the future. I have enjoyed using the wireless buds. This is just longer than a normal episode, and the battery died, and I did have it charged. So we'll get back to the point here, because the sounds aren't as important as, you know, obviously my voice is still coming through. And we need it for the outro, though. That sucks. Let me do one more thing to try to fix the sound. Let me try one more thing. Don't forget to go hang out with you, Megan, next week, by the way. Yeah, so I'm on the headset here, and I need to come back. Uh, no, I'm on the Pixel devices here. Let's, yep. Let's go over here and set this as the default and set this as default communication device and I'm gonna try hum the outro no okay let's do one more thing here that doesn't have any sound I'm a dumb dumb do this yep all right so let me throw these on real quick and we'll get back to the thing Well, lesson learned. Long episodes can't use wireless earbuds. It's good to know. I'm going to go make sure my audio is set so I at least can hear prompts. Uh, let's go over here and go to my headphones. Second audio output and go there. All right. Back to what we we're talking about. So the civil constitution of the clergy would be this death knell event document for any unity France had kind of built up to. This whole notion of one French people that Robespierre had mm, wasn't going to work. So, as the debate on the civil constitution got in a full swing, the delegates began... That should have played. I saw the bar go on desktop audio. There we go. We're back in business. What's up, Fletch? Yay, we fixed it! So as the debate around the civil constitution got into full swing in June, the delegates began to start to advise the king that he needed to be prepared to bring that concordant of Bologna to an end. This whole notion of the king appoints, the pope confirms, the high offices of the church. The assembly would legislate an end to the pope having any role in the selection of French clergy with the confirmation that he previously had, you know, that veto effectively simply being changed to that france would notify the pope of the decisions and appointments of the king this formula still of course recognized the pope as the visible head and universal leader of the catholic church but stripped his actual authority within france apart from matters anything that simply wasn't you know, purely spiritual this was a pretty audacious attack on the authority of the pope at the time, and he would again react pretty poorly. And even though in time the Constitution would kill any remaining goodwill between the revolutionaries, the church, and the clergy, at the time of its adoption, many of its tenets were embraced by the clergy. Many of the core matters that get outlined in the Civil Constitution were drawn directly from the original Cahiers grievance list of the First Estate from the days leading to the Estates General. That it outlined clergy would be paid a state salary as opposed to be, you know, being dependent on the old tithe, which doesn't exist. Priest pay would rise, while pay for bishops and high-ranking officials would fall dramatically. And that disparity of pay was one of those things that the everyday parish priest was widely complaining about in the Cai. Clergy would be required to live in the area they served. So no more bishops of Utan 
who never lived in Uton, Talleyran. Well, Talleyran was the bishop of Uton, and he had only really gone back to Uton once, which was like when he had to stand to be elected to the Estates General as the first estate representative of Uton. Service requirements for promotion within the church were made so that the sons of courtiers who were not really acting in the role of a priest or bishop, Talleyran, could not simply be appointed to a high office within the church based on that status. And any part of the church not directly involved in direct ministry to the people was simply abolished. This also reaffirmed the suppression of those monastic orders because those monastic orders didn't really work in direct ministry of the people. Mon monasteries in this time were more about cataloging events and printing copies of the Bible. They weren't like the convents. We see nuns and, and monks today doing a little bit more outreach than they did in those days. They, they were not outreach organizations in the late 17th, uh, 18th century. The only real controversial provision was that the clerics would stand for election. Let that sink in. The constitution, the, the civil constitution of the clergy was saying priests had to be elected. And this presented some problems for devout Catholics because they didn't like the idea that the electorate, those who would be voting on who would be a priest or a bishop were comprised not only of Catholics, but Protestants, atheists, and Jews. The idea that Protestants, atheists, and Jews would have a say in who could be the priest of X church was bad. It could, no. Uh -uh. And I agree with that to an extent, right? Why the hell would they have a say in that? It's not their church. Why would they get to vote on that? But the civil constitution outlined that, and it's a fatal flaw in the civil constitution of the clergy. The counter argument to that, though, is that the church had an obligation to minister and support the entire nation, not just Catholics, and so everyone should have a say as to who was a Catholic official. I don't really agree with that so much. The Catholic organization under the First Amendment that I recognize in the United States is see, the government can't tell the Catholic Church what to do with respect to the way they organize it. You just can't. On the surface, it appeared that the majority of the clergy were Prepared to accept it when it passed on July. Who's the who that? A dot. What's that? A dot is more? Welcome in. Hope you're enjoying remember the history. To clonk that follow button. Well, you just did remember to clonk that follow button. Welcome aboard. As we're closing down on episode 1.9 here, because I am almost to the end of page 15. But again, on the surface, it appeared that the majority of the clergy were really prepared to accept this. That when it, when it passed on July 12th, they, 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 could, they didn't like some of it, but they could kind of live with it. But there was still this enormous question of what's going to happen if Pope Pius VI says, don't follow that. And when the Pope does exactly that, it's going to leave the French clergy and the French nation in quite the bind. So as we said, I'm going to be off next week. There will be no episode on July 31st. But when we come back the week after, France will celebrate the first anniversary of the fall of the Bastille and what is called the Fête de la Fédération. And the first tornado of the French Revolution truly comes to an end. And the revolution has to decide, are things over? And this is the new resting point? This is the new normal for the nation? Will things regress back into the way they used to be? Or are we going to go further? Guess which one they pick? It's further. Way further. Way, way further. The Jacobins are not dead. 1789 is going to have... Society of 1789 is going to have a pretty limited shelf life. And the Jacobins are going to find themselves rising ascendant once again. Reorganized. But remember that a lot of people who were pretty important have left the Jacobins. And have left people like... Duport, Barnav, Lemet, and Maximilien Rosepierre in a more powerful situation because there are less leaders to contend with within the Jacobins. And those guys and a few others will reorganize it and come storming back and take France to the Reign of Terror, which we're closing in on. But at the same time, a gentleman named Jacques Pierre Brissot in the new Constitutional Assembly, which will one day replace the National Assembly, will begin to argue for war. All that's coming as we continue to go through the French Revolution. 
But that is where we're going to leave things for tonight. So it's time for the quiz. There are 13 questions tonight. I appreciate you all hanging out. I will get the quiz questions up, and we will get rolling. That's not playing. All right, so no music for the quiz, apparently, because why would that work? Yep, we'll go back to using a wired headset so I don't run into that problem again. Well done, Professor. Yeah, it's a lot of work. I tried to cram the last couple pages in because it's a, this is a two-and-a-half-hour episode so far. Two hours and 41 minutes so far. And uh, certainly, I know I've melted some brains tonight, so we, we needed to get it to a close. But the core points have been made. So let me get the quiz questions here. All righty. So question number one tonight. Rocket way out in front with 40. But here comes question number one of 13. Play your cards accordingly. What was the initial value of the Catholic Church property seized for auction in late 1789? Don't just give me a number. Nope. Value, not percentage or ratio. Back in late 1789, when the first one-third nationalization of the church's property was approved, the church said they would take an unspecified group of parcels worth going once, going twice, nobody, 400 million livre. So no one got it. 400 million livre of church property was initially how much they int intended to back the Ancien with. Remember, those first parcels went on to auction in early December. We're going to come back to that question and go to a different question. Just found it in my notes. Womp, womp, womp. What was the original being placed of the Society of Friends of the Constitution? What's up, Fletch? The original meeting place of the Society of Friends. That place they were leasing has a name, Starf. Convent of Jacob is not correct. Wow, did I stop you guys again? Or were there just too many notes tonight? It was a Dominican convent, the convent of going once, going twice, the Dominican convent of Saint-Jacques, hence the name Jacobins. All right, let's go back to something easier that I'm sure one of you will get. Question number three. I know how many times they met. <laughs> Too bad it's not a question. Next question. Hey, bot. Hey, you probably should spell the command right, huh? Get that off the screen. Thank you very much. Here's the next question. Name the bond that was issued back by the church's property, which eventually was turned into a form of currency. I spelled it for you during the episode. There it is. Intent Rocket just in time. The Ancignant. The Ancignant was the correct answer, but Sturf got the spelling right. But we have not held people to a spelling standard. I know what Rocket meant. The Ancignant is the correct answer, and we'll give that one to Rocket. Okie dokie. This question is worth one point for each person who answers it correctly there are three possible answers do not answer and get a second one right if you have already gotten one right i will call out if you have gotten one right up to three winners 
Yes, Turf. Here we go. Name one of the three things a member had to agree to in order to join the Jacobins initially. Again, three possible answers. Do not answer after you get one right or you will lose your point. Rights for all. Uh, a little bit more of elaboration on that. Ready to combat counter-revolutionary plots. Stir for sure. Equal rights for all. Yes. So Sturf and Rocket have gotten one. There's one left. Again, name one of the three things a member had to agree to in order to join the Jacobins initially. So you had to agree to support political equality for all, which meant you could not support passive passive citizenship. You must be ready to combat revolutionary plots. Yes, you got one, Sturf. And the last one. Going once. Going twice. You had to be dedicated to upholding a constitutional government. The next question is what was the key thing that the Jacobins established that contributed to their quick and immediate rise to significant political power? They meant public, no. They did one thing that turned them into a national political party. What was it? Established the Committee of Correspondence. That is correct. Remember, the Committee of Correspondence made them not just a body of the assembly, but a body of the nation. Rocket gets that one. The next question coming up. I want to know what you did there, sir. Where was Maximilian Rosepierre educated at, at the direction of the Bishop of Arras? You can feel the collective craps going through those who took notes. Doom, 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 doom. I know it starts with an L. You are correct. There are there's two words in there that start with an L. It's still a prestigious secondary education institution in France today. Going le le sai no. Close, but no. Going twice. It is close, but not close enough. Gone. No one gets that one. The Lycée Louis Le Grand, or currently just the Lycée in modern day times. The Lycée Louis Le Grand. I would have probably given it to you if you had just put Le Sai for Lycée. Where you said, Le Lycee, like, nah, that's not the name. That was too far off of it. Man. I made a bunch of hard questions tonight. Next question. Name the far more conservative and secretive group that filled the power void left by the failing Munarchians. The Augustinians, that is correct. Rocket. Gets it. The Augustinians would initially grab that spot of power vacancy. It would not last long, but they would grab it and subvert the relationship with the center right. Rocket got that one right. The next question. What single action sealed the fate of Thomas de Mehi, the Marquis de Havre?
The breakout attempt. That is correct. Despite the lack of evidence, there was a breakout attempt made against the jail in which the Marquis de Mejie was being held. And even though it was widely doubted that he was guilty, it sealed his fate with the public and got him hung on February 18th, 1790. And I need to spell... Got it, right. There we go. Rocket at 44. So here is the next question. What was the key moment that led to the fracturing of the left in 1790 and why? All in one line for the answer, please. The key moment that led to the fracturing of the left. Basically the fracturing. The day Louis in plain clothes came in and pronounced... That's one half of the answer, Rocket. Why was that it? The left was still trying to restore everything to the way it was. And the, nope. The left was still not trying to restore everything to the way it was for sure. Nope. That is not why the left fractured. The right was still trying to restore. The arch conservatives were certainly still trying to restore everything to the way it was. But the left was not. Give you guys one more crack at it. So it is the day that the king came down, right? So that we know to be the right answer, half of the right answer. Why is that a big deal? What about that day? He came down and said, I want to work with you. I'm going to accept the constitution. Why did that fracture the left? You can just type out the why part now. You, if you two have both gotten the what part. There were those who didn't trust his commitment. No. It showed the less radicals that the more radicals were too dangerous. Yeah. So, I'm going to give it to Rocket. It did show that. It showed the less radical members of the Jacobins that the extreme radicals were dangerous because they were refusing to embrace this handshake with the king. That they didn't want to work with the king. And that's the gist of what Rocket said. So Rocket gets the answer more correct. So just to reframe everything in here. The right wants to go back to the status quo antebellum. The way things were before the war or before what's happening. The left is like, yeah, this is where we want to be. Or the, the liberal nobles, moderate leftists are kind of like, yeah, this is where we want to be. And the king says, hey, let's work together. And they say, that sounds great. We've always wanted to. And then the real extreme radicals are like, uh-uh. We don't want to do anything with the king, but put him in a box and tell him what to do. So let me get, make sure Rocket gets her point there. We have one, two, three, four questions left. There was one other thing. In addition to the king's attendance at the assembly, what was a key piece of Jacobin debate that led liberal nobles to leave and form the Society of 1789? key item of the membership dues over to every Joe Schmo. That's the answer. Yes. The ability for non-delegates to be members of the Jacobins. Pay membership versus open membership. Nope. Because who could pay or openly join was not the question. It was you had to be a delegate or it could be anybody. That was the question. The next question. For Sturf and Rocket, who are the only two who are answering right now. What matter left the debate wide open for the Society of 1789 to swoop in and seize the momentum in the assembly in late spring slash early summer 1799? 1790. What matter left the debate wide open for the Society of 1789 to swoop in and seize the momentum in the assembly in late spring, early summer 1790? Not judicial reform. 
there was one other piece that they spurred the compromise on and swung into the middle and grabbed power. The, division, the decision of War and Peace, Nuka call for it. That is correct, Rocket. Remember, the extreme conservatives wanted to say only the king had War and Peace powers, and then the extreme radicals wanted to say only the assembly, as the only sovereign body left, had those powers. And the Society of 1789 swung in and said, why don't we have a hybrid? And it brought everybody along, and it thrust the Society of 1789 and the liberal nobles into the driver's seat. All right, two questions left. Once I fix a typo. Here we go. Good grenades, Rocket. Next question. On what date did the concept of nobility end in France in a similar manner to the night of August the 4th, 1789? June 19th. Yep, I'll take it. I didn't know if I want to take the year, but yeah, we're in 1790. It is June 19th, and Rocket got it. June 19th, 1789, again, was one of those floodgate nights legislatively where everybody wanted to get in on it, and nobility basically ends. Last question for the night. What was the critical document with the alliterative title adopted in July 12th, on July 12th, 1790, which outlined the future of the Catholic Church in France? The whole document title, please. Civil Constitution of the Clergy. Sturf gets it. The Civil Constitution of the Clergy would be a death sentence for any kind of civil unity. We talked about regions that are going to start revolting against the revolt, like out in the Vendée, and how the Jacobins had this misperception of what they were doing was really what the people wanted done. Um, that's going to all come back to bite them, and the civil constitution of the clergy is going to put it in stone that some sort of conflict is coming surrounding the way the Catholic Church is being treated, especially after the Pope says, uh-uh, that's not going to fly. I don't like any of the stuff that's already happened this year, but that's certainly not going to be something you can do. My hand just cramped. Alrighty, so let's head back over here. Let's rock! Gentlemen. There we are. We're history. Alright, so the episode is over. 15 pages of notes. It's gone on for almost three hours on the dot. There is some merch on this screen because I hit the wrong button. I hit BRB instead of back, which takes me back to this screen. Go ahead and put this back up real quick. But we're going to get out of here. Yeah, I go, out, I got, I go to sleep now. Hey, don't forget CF Live did our BRB music as well. And make sure you give those guys a follow. But we're going to get out of here for the night. Um, technical glitches aside, it's a solid episode to end the month on. Again, no episode next week. Make sure that you go. Hang out with Omega at noon next week. Give him some support. It's going to be one of those fun streams. You get to scare Nate and someone else, one of Omega's friends, is going to be there as well. It's going to be a good time. Um, get that sweet merch, including the I Was Verbally Abused by Permanu shirt. Perm's at a family reunion tonight, by the way. My lord, go f*** yourself. Good night, Sturf. And hope you all enjoyed it. Let's go see if there's someone we can raid real quick out there in Twitch land. Whoa. Yep. Um... Hmm. Anybody have a suggestion for who we shall raid, or shall we just call it a night? Terry, thank you very much. Anybody, 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 anybody? Nope, got nothing. All right, we'll just call it a night because the people I've raided, I've raided recently, and you know, leave it at that. So you guys have a good night. I will talk to you all in your streams and everyone else's streams and in the Discord. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to next No way. Yes, way. Yeah. Uh, me and Mads are going to go see some history places. Like I said, we're going to go see where the uh, first shots of the Seven Years' War in the Americas, which is the French and Indian War. It's a place called Jamonville Glen. It's near Fort Necessity, where Washington made a really, really bad stand in that war. 
Um, but we're going to go out there. Uh, it's about an hour and 30-ish minutes, hour and 40 minutes from here. But uh, it's a really beautiful spot. And uh, you can actually kind of see why it was chosen for the, the ambush that it was. But until then, I'll see you in two weeks. We'll be back for the Fête de la Fédération, which is almost certainly going to be the name of that episode. And how the nation of France celebrates one year since the Bastille fell. We'll talk to you then. Thank you, as always, for hanging out, for its support via the subscriptions and the hosts, and just for being here. I'll talk to you all then. Have a great rest of your weekend. And I'll hit the right button this time. Which is this button. See you all later. Don't forget to hang out with Dustin Monday through Saturday, 7.30 in the morning. 7.30 in the morning to 10.30. Permanue comes up after him. We've got the music, which is awesome. 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday, and sometimes on Saturday mornings with Dustin at 7.30 a.m. The Gilius, sometimes, some nights, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern Time to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. He's playing Black Flag right now via Cassis Creed series with some Far Cry sprinkled in. There's Intent Rocket Tuesdays, Thursdays in the afternoons, and on Saturdays after Dustin. Still playing that weird weave game, Persona. Party on. Dude. There's Sturfers Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Ish, except she was late last night and then argued with me over a bean and then yelled at me. There's the Omega. Next Saturday, noon, Eastern Time. Be there. Hang out with him. Do a thing for a good cause and get a NICU unit bought at Beaumont Children's Hospital. And I'll catch you all later. Have a great weekend.